have sufficient uh, personal protection equipment in place uh, to deal with any patients who may be suspected of having Ebola. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10769 in the name of John Swain, an economic opportunity for independence. And I will give a few moments for uh, people to change their seats. Thank you. Members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call on John Swinney to speak to move motion uh, to move the motion. Uh, Mr Swinney, you've got 14 minutes. Uh, Presiding officer, Scotland is a wealthy country and Scotland can be a successful independent country. That point is now well established in the referendum debate to date. So this afternoon's debate is not about can we be independent, it is about should we be independent. And it's about what are the opportunities independence will bring for us to improve Scotland's economy and to ensure that everyone can benefit from our wealth, from our resources and from our ingenuity as a country. The Government believes that the powers of independence and the ability to take decisions for ourselves will give Scotland a means to grow our own economy by focusing on what matters to us, to get more people into work, to improve living standards and to create new opportunities for our young people to build their careers here in Scotland. 2014 it will represent a year of progress for the Scottish economy. Just last month, official statistics indicated that the Scottish economy grew by 1% during the first quarter of the year, faster than the UK's growth of 0.8%, and led to the, to, to the fastest annual growth in over three years. Scotland's economy has now officially moved to pre-recession levels of output, three months ahead of the rest of the United Kingdom. And as the Scottish Government's Chief Economist State of the Economy report highlighted last week, our economy has shifted from recovery into expansion mode, and this is set to be Scotland's best year since the UK recession began. Indeed, yesterday's Bank of Scotland PMI showed that private sector output in Scotland expanded for the 22nd consecutive month during July, with the fastest, growth, uh, fastest rate of growth in six months. Such trends have also led to an improvement in the labour market, with employment up by 76,000 over the year to around 2.6 million, and employment and economic activity now at uh, appropriate levels um, of, uh, uh, of, 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 of performance. These facts demonstrate the healthy outlook for the Scottish economy, but they also fundamentally undermine the claims made by the Chancellor of the Exchequer in November 2011 that the referendum, that referendum uncertainty is damaging investment in Scotland. In reality, the most recent Ernst & Young Attractiveness Survey of International Investment reported that during 2013, the number of international investment projects in Scotland rose by 8% to the highest number of projects since 1997. So we would begin life as an independent country from a strong base. Excluding North Sea oil and gas, output per head in Scotland is the third highest of any nation or region within the United Kingdom, behind only London and the South East. I went, uh, of course... Um, I, I'm, I'm pleased that the Finance Secretary recognises the progress the whole of the United Kingdom economy is making. But, but can, I, can I take him back to his interview with Gary Robertson last week in the BBC? Has he had time to reflect since then about, rather than ruling all the options in and ruling all the options out, whether he actually has a stated plan B for the currency? And is he going to tell us this afternoon? Cabinet Secretary. What, what, what I would simply say to, to Mr Rennie, is that the government has gone through a process of exploring uh, in great detail with the Fiscal Commission the various options that would be available to an independent country. Uh, the uh, Fiscal Commission uh, assessed a number of different options. They set out there were a number of perfectly viable options and they recommended the option which they considered to be the one that was the most appropriate for Scotland. So Mr Rennie, and this really shouldn't be a surprise to him, shouldn't be at all surprised that the Scottish Government chooses what we consider to be best for the people of Scotland, yeah. the one that will yeah. deliver the needs and the aspirations yeah. of the people of Scotland, which is exactly what we have set out. I may give way to Mr Rennie in due course, because I'll make some further comments about currency in... in uh, OK. About the Fiscal Commission Working Group, the Government have said, if we don't get a currency union, we will walk away from the entirety of the debt. Do all members of the Fiscal Commission Working Group, including the Nobel Laureates, support that particular argument? What, what, the, 
the fish, well, Mr. Uh, Brown will be should just look at what the fiscal commission have yeah, said. They've said exactly. what they've said. Mm. What the government has set out is that if the United Kingdom government is going to advance an argument which is about seizing the assets of the United Kingdom and not engaging in a fair distribution of the assets between the rest of the United Kingdom and Scotland, then why on earth should an independent Scotland take on its appropriate share of debt, which we are perfectly prepared to take on, given that the United Kingdom government is prepared to act in such a reckless fashion? That is the consequence of the recklessness of the UK government. So an independent Scotland has contributed more in tax revenues per head of population than the rest of the UK in every one of the last 33 years. We have oil and gas reserves that will last for decades and renewable energy reserves that will last forever. We have key strengths in diverse sectors from food and drink to life sciences to advanced manufacturing. We have more universities in the world's top 200 per head than any other country on the planet and the most highly educated workforce in Europe. These are strong foundations upon, from which a, an independent Scotland can emerge. We will begin life as an independent nation in full knowledge of the benefits taking decisions for ourselves can bring. Central to the Scottish Government's argument about why we should be independent is the record of this Parliament. Over the last 15 years, the Scottish Parliament has worked hard to create a fairer society and a more competitive economy. We have established the most business-friendly local taxation system in the UK, with, over, with our small business bonus scheme reducing or removing business rates for over 92,000 business premises. We have supported Scottish Enterprise and HIE at a time when the UK Government has scrapped its regional development agencies. We have undertaken a range of initiatives to protect capital expenditure despite cuts of 26 per cent by Westminster. And we have invested to improve the, uh, the fabric of the Scottish economy, to improve the labour market and to ensure that we are in a situation where our, labor, our employment rate has moved from a position of being 2.6 percentage points below the UK in 1999 to 0.2 percentage points higher in the most recent figures that are available. So the the ability to take certain economic decisions here in Scotland has been a strength for the country. The Scottish Government has ambitions to do more by taking a wider range of economic decisions which only arises as a consequence of independence. All of us know that despite Scotland's great wealth, its huge potential, too many people in our society don't feel the benefits of that wealth. We know that other countries have been more successful and utilising all of their resources and harnessing the benefit of those resources for the future. And we know that countries with the full powers of independent nations perform better, not just economically, but in measures of social well-being into the bargain. In 2011, the OECD reported that income inequality has increased by more in the UK than in any other country in the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development since 1975. The UK now has the highest levels of regional inequalities in the EU, while we have made improvements to our productivity rates relative to the UK, our productivity is still 22% lower than in Denmark, 20% lower in Germany and 13% lower in Sweden. So the ability of us to use uh, the powers of independence to create a stronger economic platform for the people of Scotland is demonstrated by the performance of other small independent countries that show exactly how we could strengthen the economic base of Scotland and how we could have greater and higher ambitions as a consequence. Uh, of course, yes. If all that is true, why is it that Scottish unemployment figures since January have actually gotten worse, whereas they've improved in England and Wales since the start of this year? <coughs> well, I, th I think what, the, what I've cautioned Jenny Mara about in the past is about looking at um, some of the annual comparisons about unemployment, where she will see on annual comparisons, looking at issues right across the year, seeing the relative contribution of one year versus another, that unemployment in Scotland is lower than it was 12 months ago, and employment is at a record high. How on earth can Jenny Mara not get up and make an intervention and welcome the fact yeah. that employment in Scotland is at a record high as a consequence of the interventions and the measures that the Scottish Government is taking? Independence would allow future Scottish Governments to combine our powers over business investment, employment creation, taxation and welfare to secure stronger levels of economic growth from which all of the people of Scotland could benefit. It would ensure economic policy is designed for the needs and the opportunities of the Scottish economy, provide greater flexibility in decision-making and offer an opportunity to rebalance our economy.
Our economic case for independence has at its heart a plan to improve business conditions and re-industrialise Scotland through initiatives such as using our tax powers to support high value manufacturing and key sectors vital to the Scottish economy, boosting innovation through the establishment of an innovation agency and encouraging and motivating greater private sector investment in research and development, integrating skills and employability by bringing together job matching, employability training and career guidance, improving, improving in a moment, improving access to finance through a Scottish <coughs> Business Development Bank and expanding our international presence and reach through using a network of overseas embassies dedicating to, dedicated to boosting Scottish exports. These are just some of the measures that the Government of an independent Scotland could take to strengthen our economic foundations. I'll give way to Mr Brown. Does the Cabinet Secretary support the creation of an innovation agency regardless of the result of the referendum? What I would want an innovation agency to be able to do is to make a discernible impact on the performance of the economy by, you, by, by, by working with the government to use the tax powers yeah. that would be available yeah. to the government yeah. to encourage and to incentivise the development of innovation yeah. policy yeah. and innovation delivery within Scotland. The, the Scottish Government has already taken forward, I'm surprised Mr Brown's not au okay fait with this point, yeah. we've taken forward a range of innovation centre proposals okay. supported through the, funding council, the Scottish yeah. Funding Council, yeah. Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands yeah. Enterprise. Yeah. Good work is being done already, yeah. we're doing that yeah. within our existing powers, but we're still only operating at one quarter of the level of private sector R&D investment in the Scottish economy uh, without the, uh, in comparison to uh, comparable countries. So we need to have the powers the tax powers to ensure we can strengthen the operation of the Scottish economy and to encourage and to motivate uh, those points. Uh, I'll give way to Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. Cabinet Secretary mentioned taxation. I wonder if you could point to uh, the taxation rates in Scandinavia and Germany uh, and tell us what the corporate tax rate is there. And when, can you also point to anywhere where lowering, lowering, lowering corporation tax has created full employment, as he claims he can. Well, well that, that's per, perhaps maybe a point that Gordon Brown should have reflected on when he was reducing corporation tax in the United yes, Kingdom. Yes, and, of course, yes. Mr Finlay and Mr Brown are notionally joined at the hip in this campaign. Uh, we could also seek the removal of barriers to competition, such as the current air passenger duty scheme, which has been recommended for change by the UK parties, but one in which they have failed to deliver. And, of course... It is a scandal that despite being one of the richest countries in the world, an estimated additional 30,000 children in Scotland have been pushed into poverty in the last year, in part due to the UK Government's welfare changes, and a further 100,000 face the prospect of that if we are not empowered to change course. These are some of the opportunities we have to change the economic direction of Scotland as a consequence of winning the powers of independence. We will, of course, do all of this using our currency, the pound, Today, it is what the vast majority of people in Scotland want us to do. Today's social attitude survey shows that 68% of people want an independent Scotland to use the pound in a currency union, and far more people believe there will be a currency union than by the bluster of the no campaign, yeah, which, of course, yeah, we yeah. hear about all the bluster in this parliamentary chamber in, uh, on a daily and a weekly basis. Only independence provides us access to the levers of Order. responsibility that will enable us to put Scotland's economy on the footing to tackle the long-term <laughs> challenges of inequality and the need to secure greater prosperity for the people of Scotland. Uh, one of the best examples of that is the steps the government can take on childcare. We are doing a great deal of investment in, under, in, uh, under devolution to invest in childcare, but only independence allows us to use the resources that are currently invested in the Trident nuclear missile system yep. to redirect that yes. to invest in childcare within Scotland and crucially, yep. and crucially for us to be able Indeed. to reap the rewards of that through Absolutely. the tax system yeah. and what that generates in investments in the public finances of an independent Scotland. Order. So these are some of the choices that are available to us if we are prepared to take the step to support independence in the referendum in September. We've heard a great deal from the other parties about the promises of further economic powers if there is a no vote in September. Uh, Presiding officer, it will not be lost on any of us that even some of the proposals that have been set out by the UK parties already set out by the Calman Commission have not been delivered to the people of Scotland. Yeah. Why should we have any confidence that any of these powers will come to us in due course? Presiding officer, the people of Scotland in September have the opportunity 
to take responsibility into their own hands, to build on the record of this Parliament, which has been about taking decisions about the people of Scotland's future based on the needs and the aspirations of the people of Scotland. Independence gives us the chance to link all the remaining powers that are currently being misused by Westminster and used properly for the benefit of the people of Scotland to create the prosperous and just society that all of us want to live in. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Ian Gray to speak to and move Amendment 10769.1. Mr Gray, 10 minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. This must be the uh, third or fourth uh, attempt uh, since the White Paper the Cabinet Secretary has made at an economic plan for independence. Uh, so we can't accuse him of not trying. Uh, but today's effort really has nothing new to say and simply rehashes all his previous failed attempts. It's rather like one of those disappointing greatest hits albums, which when you get them home, turn out to be full of old songs, which were in fact flops the first time around. I suppose we should be glad at least that this one is held together by staples rather than a paper clip, uh, but there are few other improvements. It largely covers policy areas where the Scottish Government already has power, such as education and training, childcare, infrastructure investment, promoting renewables, promoting innovation too. It makes assertions about economic benefits, evidenced by nothing except references back to the Scottish Government's own previous documents making the same assertions. It includes now you see them, now you don't policies, like the Development Bank, which has been launched and relaunched on a number of occasions. It repeats figures about the economic impact, for example, of childcare, which do not add up and which the government have already had to admit were simply made up without any modelling. And today we find out that the Scottish government also had had to admit that their figures on the impact of productivity, employment rates and on migration have also been made up without any economic modelling. The report talks about powers to incentivise growth and jobs creation, the Cabinet Secretary <coughs> spoke about that at length again today. But yet again, the only actual policy uh, the plan outlines is a 3% cut in corporation tax, which it claims could create 27,000 jobs. Now, this claim does have some modelling behind it, published three years ago. So I asked Spice to have a look at it. Not only do they tell us that the calculations are based on 2006, when the corporation tax rate was 30%, they also tell us that, by accident or design, the Scottish Government used the headline rate change, 3%, in their job calculation, when they should, in fact, have used the effective rate change, 1.2%, by their own calculation. To quote Spice, if the effective rate change was used instead of the change in headline rate, then the number of additional foreign direct investment jobs would be 60% fewer than in the Scottish Government's analysis. So, most of the claims in this plan have no credible figures behind them at all, and where they do, the Scottish Government has got its sums wrong again. Compare those hollow promises to the 800 jobs secured this morning by another MOD order for the Clyde, real jobs building real ships in the real world. Now, if Mr Swinney's assertions about the benefits of independence had any credibility, then surely those in the businesses he says would benefit from the increase in economic opportunity would be convinced of his case. But they are not. Big financial companies remain unconvinced. Companies like Standard Life, who employ 5,000 people in this city, managing £254 billion of assets for a customer base 90% situated in the rest of the UK. They told us just last week that after five months they've had no answers to their concerns about independence and their preparations to move business and personnel out of Scotland continue. Large manufacturing companies remain unconvinced too, like Weirs, whose Chief Executive Keith Cochrane recently said that their material issues had not been addressed and that independence would damage investment in Scotland, not help it. Energy companies the industry so beloved of the Scottish Government remain unconvinced too. Companies like Infinis, who last week put their current wind power developments in Scotland on hold until after the referendum. 
Small and medium-sized companies remain unconvinced. Companies like Endura, who I met a couple of weeks ago. This is a company who design, make and sell top-of-the-range cycle wear across the world from Livingston. They marry innovation, technology, R&D, design and fashion to compete in a global market. They employ women, they employ graduates, they clothe the top touring cycle team in the world. This company does everything right. And they are adamant that a yes vote would require them to start moving operations and jobs to Europe on September the 19th. That's how unconvinced Scotland is of the premise that independence will create economic opportunity. And you know, President Officer, the past week can only have increased their concerns. Because there is nothing more fundamental to economic opportunity than a stable economic base, and nothing more fundamental to that than a stable currency. And no matter how glittering the image the Cabinet Secretary asks us to dream of of the opportunities of independence, as long as he has no answers on currency, his whole proposition has feet of clay. Sure. Roddy. The, if, thank you for taking the intervention. If the member would care to comment on the announcement by Alistair Darling last year on Newsnight when he said a sterling zone is in the interests of Scotland and the rest of the UK. If you have independence, of course, the currency union is desirable and logical. Of course, yeah, currency, really? currency union is desirable. I desire a currency union as well. That's why I'm voting no next month, and that's why Alistair Darling's voting no next month. The First Minister, writing on the Sunday Press this weekend, said the language of politics can be instructive and deeply revealing to the motives and priorities of individuals, parties and campaigns. How true. So what of his language on currency? It's our pound and we are keeping it, come what may. No currency union, no debt. That is indeed deeply revealing because it is not the language of someone whose motive is to liberate the Scottish economy. This is the language of someone threatening to take the Scottish economy hostage and blow it up if he doesn't get his own way. Because what it promises is a Scotland without its own currency, without a central bank, with no say whatsoever in monetary policy, and without any credibility with lenders. This is a recipe for impoverishment, not a plan for jobs. The, NEI, sorry, the NEICSR summed it up coolly last week. This is likely, sterilisation, this is likely to have important consequences for Scotland's financial sector and therefore its capacity to export financial services, its new balance of payments and general economic prosperity. In other words, 200,000 jobs in the financial services sector and 15% of our exports would be in jeopardy just for starters. And as long ago as December, the economist David Owen of Jefferies Limited told us that walking away from debt would raise the cost of borrowing by 5%. Investment would be hit, public finances would suffer and mortgages would go up. What is more, membership of the European Union requires a currency and a central bank. So a sterilised Scotland would not be able to stay in the European Union. Well, they scoff, but if they can explain to me why the European Union would break its whole history and allow a country without a central bank or its own currency in, then I would be very interested to hear it. Indeed, even the Scottish Government's own fiscal commission dismissed this option out of hand. And yet, this is now the Scottish Government's desperate fallback currency plan. And perhaps Mr Swinney should direct his boss, the First Minister, to read what the Fiscal Commission says, not the rest of us. And it would be uh, sure then, if he had read it, that he would not describe this option as quite attractive. But the most irresponsible thing about this currency car crash is that the potential victims are not the banks and businesses of Scotland, but ordinary Scots. They won't be able to make the higher mortgage payments or move their money out of Scotland to somewhere else or up sticks and follow jobs if companies do relocate them. Presiding officer, 
I believe, I say again, that Scotland's best economic prospects lie in a currency union with the rest of the United Kingdom and the Bank of England as lender of last resort. Just as I believe the best platform for economic success and full employment we can have is a single energy market, a UK-wide financial services industry, a home market of 63 million people with open and fettered borders across the, their countries, continuing membership of the European Union but not the Euro, MOD contracts like the aircraft carriers and the one we heard about this morning, access to UK-wide research funding for all of our universities. These are things we have. Only independence places them in jeopardy. That is why I move the amendment in my name and why we should vote positively, proudly and resoundingly no on September the 18th. Thank you very much. I now call on Gavin Brown to speak to and move Amendment 10769.1.1. Mr Brown, six minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to begin on the issue of currency and specifically on the intervention that I made on the Cabinet Secretary during his opening remarks. Because the official Scottish Government position, as said by Mr Swinney yet again last week, is that if we don't get a currency union, we will simply walk away from the entirety of the debt. Now, it's one thing for a politician being a bit reckless to say something like that, but it's quite another for economists to say that. And the question that I put to Mr Swinney was very specific. Do all members of the Fiscal Commission Working Group, including their two Nobel laureates, support that particular argument? We know that the Fiscal Commission Working Group have recommended a currency union, but that wasn't the question I asked. Do they support the assertion by the Scottish Government that they can simply walk away from the entirety of the debt were there not to be a currency union? I've read the Fiscal Commission Working Group reports, Deputy Presiding Officer. I've read their published statements. I've read the minutes of their meetings. And I haven't been able to trace anywhere a specific comment from that group saying that they all think that that is a logical an intelligent or even a correct thing to say or do. Now, I understand, or at least it was reported in the press at the weekend, that the chair of the Fiscal Commission Working Group will be giving a keynote speech on Monday of next week. I ask the Scottish Government again, in that keynote speech, or even before that keynote speech, will there be a firm uh, statement made publicly by the Scottish Government that every member of their working group support that argument? Because if they do not, they are standing pretty much by themselves. Economists have pointed out that that is not a logical position to take. Even economists who support independence cannot support that particular assertion and claim made by the Scottish Government. If they cannot do so, their position on currency is even weaker than has appeared over the last couple of weeks. Deputy Presiding Officer, let's move now on to the substantive part on the Government motion about the economic growth that they say they're going to be able to achieve were we to separate. There is a gaping hole in the Scottish Government's position. What they have been unable to say at all is what are the industries, what are the big ticket industries that are not coming to Scotland at the moment because of the constitutional setup, but suddenly they're going to all be coming to Scotland because we're independent. What are the industries, the big ticket industries, that are being held back by being part of the United Kingdom, but they are desperate for Scotland to become independent? And in one second, and what are the actual hard policies? Not the sound bites, not the claims. What are the hard policies that are going to be brought in? Or what are the hard policies that we couldn't already do that are going to make this stratospheric difference. I give way to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Mr. Mr. Brown's probing to find out what industries are not coming. 
Mr Brown's colleague, the Chancellor, told us that various industries wouldn't come because we were having a referendum debate, and he was proved to be comprehensively Wrong. speaking nonsense yeah, as a consequence yeah, yeah. of the performance of our economy. So why does Mr Brown accept that the detail that's set out in Outlook for Scotland's Public Finances and the Opportunities for Independence, or the Economic Leavers paper that was published in November, or the White Paper in November, contain all the answers to the material that he's looking for? Gavin Brown. Unfortunately, Deputy Presiding Officer, I've read the White Paper. I've read the Reindustrialisation of Scotland paper. I've read the 10 Greatest Hits paper that came out this morning. I've read every piece of paper that the Scottish Government has produced, and the answers are not there. The answers are not there. Let me give you a Mr. simple Swinney. illustration then. Mr. Swinney. If, if he wishes to make an intervention, I'm happy to take one, Deputy Presiding Officer. Okay. Mr. Well, Swinney. Can't, well, Mr. Brown's round off all the different documents that he's read. Why doesn't he just report to Parliament on the contents of those documents yeah. so that Parliament can hear all the contents of those documents rather than simply repeating a speech which supports his narrative in this yeah, debate. Exactly. Let's de deal with the material the government has published to support the arguments that were set out yeah, in yeah, all Mr. of these documents. <laughs> it's, it's a bit rich to accuse me of repeating a speech, <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. Mine isn't a repetition, and at least I've written my own speeches, Cabinet Secretary. But he asked for the detail. He, OK, let me focus on the detail. Then they say they're going to have a Scottish Business Development Bank. This was announced a year and a half ago by the Cabinet Secretary. We're going to be doing this come what may. It was re-announced at the budget in September last year, and it was quietly dropped in March of this year, only to resurface a couple of months later as a big idea of what we're going to do. No credibility on that particular issue. We heard about corporation tax, which, which no modelling has been done since 2011. It has completely ignored the actual corporation tax of the United Kingdom. Well, if it has been done since 2011, I'm sure he can tell us. It says that it takes 20 years for their headline figures to work, and it assumes zero response, zero response from the rest of the United Kingdom in Scotland reducing their corporation tax. Deputy Presiding Officer, this government's credibility is withering by the day. They had no answer on currency. All of their financial projections rely on high oil every single year of independence. They tell us the high ones are actually conservative estimates and they have no real plan for economic growth. A group of soundbites which are not convincing this chamber and I don't believe will convince the people of Scotland. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And we now move to the open debate. Uh, six minute speeches are thereby, and I call on Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you Mr. very much, Mr. President, uh, and, uh, and welcome to today's debate. Can I say, over the course of the recent recess, I have, I suspect we all have uh, been out knocking uh, doors in uh, our areas, and I've been speaking to many people uh, across the area I represent. And I've been uh, very keen to make the point that all uh, except Scotland could be an independent country. I think, as the Cabinet Secretary said, this is uh, now universally accepted. Surely no one in here would suggest Scotland couldn't be an independent country. And of course, we know that uh, the Prime Minister has said it would be wrong to suggest Scotland couldn't be a successful independent country. We know that Ruth Davidson, the uh, leader of Scottish Tories, has also uh, said the same thing. Alistair Darling uh, has said the same thing, although he seemed uh, somewhat unwilling uh, to get to that place in a, a recent debate. Uh, Michael Moore uh, has said the same thing. And indeed, the Permanent Secretary to the Treasury, Nick McPherson, has said if there's a yes vote, Scotland will still be a prosperous economy and of course they have said that because it reflects what others out there are saying. The Financial Times has said uh, that Scotland is richer than the rest of the UK in the top 20 countries globally in terms of GDP per head. Standard & Poor's has said even excluding North Sea output Scotland would qualify for their highest economic assessment. The head of the Institute for Fiscal Studies which is often cited in debates in here has said the statement that this is a rich and successful economy is one I would entirely agree with and there is other uh, evidence out there. So of course. Briefly. Um, when, when he's knocking on these doors in his constituency, is he asked by constituents what his plan B on the currency and is, it, and is he able to answer the question? It well, actually might surprise uh, Mr Rennie to find that actually currency isn't an issue that particularly comes up uh, that often when I uh, knock the doors. I see Mr Brown is laughing. I suspect I'm knocking rather more doors than you are uh, over the last few weeks, uh, Mr uh, Brown. But the question is uh, not so much could uh, we be an independent country, 
Uh, but should we be an independent country? And let me explore some of the things that uh, come up on some of the doors uh, I talk about, because some of the people that I, I am uh, engaging with in my constituency will be some of the people I want to go on to talk about. Because a message I've heard uh, much of in recent times from the No campaign is uh, that uh, we are in the best of both worlds, a strong Scottish part and the strength of the security of uh, the UK. Well, let's uh, examine their uh, best of uh, both uh, worlds. Because I think that can only mean something if it actually means something to people on the ground. As part of the UK, uh, we are in a, a society where the wealthiest 10% of uh, households own 900 times uh, the wealth of the least the wealthy 10%. The UK is one of the most heavily indebted uh, nations in uh, the world. The UK has had the weakest economic performance, with the exception of Italy, of any G7 uh, nation. Uh, and uh, the UK is one of the most regionally uh, unbalanced economies in the world. I think uh, I don't need to remind Mr Rennie, who's stepped away from his uh, desk, uh, that his uh, colleague Vince Cable, uh, uh, who is himself a London MP, uh, said uh, at the end of last year that London is a, a kind of giant suction machine draining the life out of the rest of the country, even though there's no sign that he uh, or his government are going to do anything about it. I won't give way at the moment, Mr Gray. I have a lot to uh, say today. I'd also question this uh, idea of uh, the best of uh, both worlds. How will those who are struggling to find work, how uh, will those who are in work but don't have enough uh, to uh, get by, uh, who worry uh, that their hopes and ambitions for their children won't be achieved, uh, those who look forward to the future with uh, some uh, uncertainty, how will they relate to this idea of uh, the best of both worlds? How can uh, members in here uh, argue that we're better together in the best of both worlds when uh, the Chancellor is committed to an additional uh, £25 billion in cuts uh, to public spending of re-elected in 2015? How can Labour members argue that we are better together on the best of both worlds when their party, no I will not Mr Finlay, when their party has said, like the Tories, uh, that they are wedded to austerity of their re-elected in 2015, Ed Miliband said that Labour will cut uh, spending. How can we better together, uh, be better together in the best of both worlds uh, when Oxfam recently set out that the UK's five richest families now own more wealth than the poorest 20 per cent of the population? How can we be better together and in the best of both worlds when, uh, with a UK government, we did not uh, choose as imposing a welfare reform agenda that is resulting in 100,000 uh, more children uh, living in poverty uh, and driving thousands of families in Scotland uh, to uh, food banks. Uh, and we know that if we remain, uh, no I will not, uh, Ms Mara, I've got quite a lot to say today so I won't give way, uh, we uh, know that if we remain a uh, part of the UK there are those cuts ahead, we know that there is the austerity agenda, we know about the disinvestment that is planned for the National Health Service uh, down south that will reduce the amount we have to spend on devolved areas, a position understood by the Labour Party in Wales. Mark Drakeford, Labour Minister for Health and Social Services in the Welsh Government, has said that is what the fundamental problem is here. We have a Westminster Government that believes in shrinking the state, which believes in doing less through the public realm and passes less money down to us in order to be able to do it. That truth, no I will not, and I'm in my last minute, I'm afraid, Mr Brown, that truth for the Welsh Assembly Government is true eh, for us eh, here too. That is the future eh, we face uh, with a no vote, and with less to spend on public services, that will damage our economy. Independence gives us the chance to move our economy forward, to give uh, more people more opportunities here in Scotland. We can match uh, the performance of other uh, similar-sized independent countries in terms of product productivity, population growth and employment. Uh, we will generate £5 billion extra ta revenue, tax revenues within 15 years to say nothing of a more uh, fairer and more prosperous uh, society. And we know some of the things the Scottish Government has pledged to do, transforming childcare with its radical proposals, establishing a fair work commission to ensure work pays uh, and to help improve working lives, and supporting uh, uh, a Scottish industry with an industrial strategy to strengthen, boost and promote our close, existing base. These are some of the opportunities with independence, President Officer. These are some of the opportunities if Scotland votes yes in just over a month's time. Much. Now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Maureen uh, Watts. Also, I think Jim Hepburn should get uh, Jim Hepburn to go out a bit more if he thinks people aren't talking about the currency. But I suppose we should, uh, we should be pleased, we should be grateful to the Scottish Government for this rehash of the white paper because one of my constituents contacted me this morning because he'd got in touch with the Scottish Government and been told that more copies of the white paper would be available in five weeks' time. So uh, we, 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 should be, we should be grateful. Now, the only new thing I heard today was Trident is now going to pay for childcare. Now, I had such a long list last week about all the things that Trident was paying for, and now I can add childcare to it. But, of course, all we had today was assertions, three kinds of assertions, the misleading ones, 
you know, Scotland, uh, uh, more uh, in tax revenues. True, but of course we didn't hear about the fact we have more public expenditure. I think the last year for which figures were available, £700 more per head tax in Scotland because of the oil, we received £1,200 more per head in public exped uh, expenditure. Many of the other uh, assertions could actually be delivered now, so they're not problematic, it's just that they're not being delivered. And other ones, of course, were assertions about what would happen in terms of increased productivity, for example, but absolutely no detail or explanation of how it was to be happened. The only specific policy we got was the folly, once again, of uh, outdoing the Tories on corporation tax. And since John Swinney will now be standing up telling me about Gordon Brown, you should know that Labour, Labour is committed to increasing the rate of corporation tax by one pence. And yet, in spite of what his fiscal commission tells him about the folly of a three pence below the UK rate, he is hell-bent on doing it. You should look at what happened in Canada when they had a big cut in corporation tax. Business hoarded the money and there were hikes in executive pay. So think again on that. But the reality is whatever economic objectives and dreams he have are dependent on secure currency arrangements and sound public finances. And the reality is in both those key regards, we are better off now than we would be. We already have a currency uh, union and the benefits of a deeply integrated UK economy without borders. Remember in a new uh, book from the David Hume Institute this week, David Bell's reminding us that GDP, fa GDP falls by 5% because of the border effect. And remember, 70% of our exports go to England, 74% of our imports are from England. By contrast, 14% of our UK uh, exports to here and 8% of their imports from Scotland. And that puts in context the issue of transaction costs, which we keep hearing about when we're talking uh, about uh, currency. Now, I know I have no time at all. I know the Cabinet Secretary has a great deal of respect for Gavin McCrone and some of his colleagues quote him on the off. And so this is Gavin McCrone speaking, not George Osborne, not Ed Balls or anybody else. And Gavin McCrone at the Finance Committee on the 7th of May, column 4107, said the problem that I see is that I cannot imagine a Chancellor of the Exchequer for the remainder of the United Kingdom with no electoral responsibility for Scotland being prepared to put taxpayers at risk in the rest of the country for the sake of Scottish debt and bank debt in Scotland. That is Gavin McCrone. And it seems to me infantilism uh, in the part of the Scottish Government to say we have a sovereign mandate not recognising the fact that once you're independent, other countries also have a sovereign mandate. And Peter Jones has a devastating critique of that whole government attitude in the Scotsman this morning. And one final point at the same finance committee, John Kay said, if there were to be a currency union, the one of the reasons why it will never happen is because the Scottish government could never accept the terms because bye-bye cutting corporation tax, bye-bye three billion extra borrowing, which John Swinney wants in 2016. Now we know what their plan B is, it's sterilisation, and we were told last week in a devastating and important report the banks would be off to England. There would be much higher rates than the higher interest rates we would already have, uh, and people have questioned whether that would be acceptable as well to the EU. Remember, 15% of our exports are financial services, so a lot of rhetoric today about exports, but that's the reality of a very key export sector uh, in the event of Scottish independence. Now, I have no time. I could have spent the whole speech giving independent experts on the fiscal situation. The IFS, the CPPR, Citigroup, Pension Policy Institute, Brian Ashdrop, Martin Wolf. I haven't got time to do that. Quickly, two quotes, Angus Armstrong and Monique Bell. An independent Scotland is likely to require a more restrictive fiscal stance than proposed by the coalition government for many years. And secondly, Rowena Crawford and Gemma Tatlow, also of the National Institute, our broad conclusion is that Scotland faces a tougher long-run fiscal challenge than the UK as a whole, is robust to a variety of alternative sensible assumptions. So the spending commitments on which, which is the basis now of the appeal of the uh, Scottish Government to the Scottish uh, people, is a cruel deception on the Scottish people. Because the reality is, under independence in 2016, we would have, well, the upfront corporation tax, we'll lose hundreds of millions of pounds right away with that. The childcare money has to be upfront as well. Obviously, we uh, support the objectives of childcare policy, although, of course, Trident's paying for that and a hundred other things as well. We have the overseas embassies in today's paper. Well, we have actually a body called 
called Scottish Development International that already does all this for us, but we need to pay for these 90 embassies now apparently to have exports abroad. We have the loss of the pension bonus. Remember, we get £500 million pounds more for pensioners and pension benefits in Scotland than our, than our population share would dictate. We've got the demographics going to accentuate that particular problem. We've got public sector pensions. They're never mentioned. There are more public sector workers in Scotland. That's covered by the UK now. It wouldn't be. My final minute. It seems to me we won't hear very much more about the economy from the Scottish Government over the next five years. In five weeks, it'll be all the, the warm words about we can do this and we won't have the Tories anymore. The reality is what we're going to have for the next five weeks is project which and project scare from the Yes campaign because project jobs and project prosperity are holed beneath the waterline. Thank you very much. And I now call on Maureen Watt to be followed by Willie Rennie. Six minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be given the opportunity to contribute to this timely debate, as I believe the voters on the 18th of September are really interested in knowing about the strengths of the Scottish economy. For far too long, in order to keep Scots in their place and for Westminster to dictate what they think is best for Scotland, we've been led to believe that Scotland is too poor and too weak to be the strong, vibrant and growing economy for all our people that it has the potential to be. So while Alistair Darling last Tuesday on television couldn't bring himself to stand up for Scotland and his constituents and agree that Scotland can be independent, we know, of course, that he has in the past uh, shown that Scotland can be an independent country. For example, in The Guardian in 2012, uh, when asked, he said, of course it could, as did Ruth Davidson on the 27th of May uh, 2011, when she said Scotland is big enough, rich enough and good enough to be an independent country. And the former Secretary of State for Scotland, Michael Moore, said you will never hear me suggest that Scotland could not go its own way. And even Alistair Darling's pal, Nick McPherson, the Permanent Secretary to the Treasury, said if there's a yes vote, Scotland will still be a prosperous country, as stated in the Sunday Post of the 2014. Ian Gray. The theme of many of the speeches from the bench is opposite. Perhaps we could deal with it. Will she accept that all of these people she quoted said those things, but they all also said that Scotland's prospects were better as part of the United Kingdom? I was trying to point out why, while they say that, that Scotland could be a, a prosperous country, of course it should be a pres prosperous country. Sit down, Ms Mara, I want to continue. So members of all the Better Together parties know that Scotland can be an independent country and currently it pays its way, more than pays its way, within the Union and so has the potential to do so much more and re release the wealth of our resources to the benefit of all our people. Yet we still hear too many in the unionist camp say that we're too small and not capable of controlling our energy industry, particularly our energy industry and the oil and gas sector. Which other country, better together folk, has discovered oil and gas and been poorer than it is there was before it discovered it? Tell me that, Mr Gray. Wait, wait. Gray. Will she give me one excuse me, one single quote for someone supporting the case for the United Kingdom said Scotland was too wee, too poor and too stupid. One single quote. Or did what? she just make that up? I haven't made it up one. because on every single thing where they say that we're not capable, that's the implication that they are making. <laughs> Presiding officer, the way in which the successive Westminster governments have mismanaged the oil and gas industry is plain to see. Not only have they continually underestimated and underplayed the size and benefit of this resource, but have also failed miserably to use the income from it to benefit the people of the UK, never mind Scotland, and to see that it would benefit future generations. The UK and Iraq are the only two countries which have not set up uh, an oil fund for benefit of future generations. Scotland has 60% of Europe's oil reserves and about 40% of the national gas reserves. But Sir Ian Wood's UK uh, 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 review on maximising recovery said the clear views expressed were that fiscal instability has been a significant factor in basin underperformance. 
This is not surprising since we've had numerous changes to the fiscal regime in the North Sea over the last decade, and we've had 14 UK oil ministers over the last decade and in, in the last 17 years, three of those in the last four years. That's hardly a situation where energy ministers can get to know the industry and understand its long-term needs. So that's why the people of Scotland are best placed to manage this resource. They know about it. And Professor John Patterson of Aberdeen University said he believed an independent Scottish government could offer more predictability to the industry rather than less. And Tony Hayward, former Chief Executive BP, said the industry is very good at working with whoever happens to be in power, as did Ed Daniels, chairman of Shell UK, said it's up to the people of Scotland and they will work with whoever. Presiding officer, that's why 64% of North Sea oil and gas workers are likely to vote yes. And the recent 20th uh, survey of the Aberdeen and Grampian Chambers of Commerce oil and gas survey of June this year uh, said that out of 700 firms surveyed, more believed that independence would be positive rather than negative. So with the value of oil discovered to have been equal value, so the val value of oil still to be uh, exploited, to have equal value of that already, already discovered, of course, an independent Scotland has a bright future. It's very interesting that the uh, latest edition of the Investors Chronicle stated, believes, st stated that it believes that Westminster has deliberately downplayed the potential of the UK continental shelf ahead of September's referendum on Scottish independence. And indeed, the Financial Times, I think it was, or the Investors Chronicle said that this is undermining the investment and the the um, buying of shares of certain oil companies. That is absolutely disgraceful. So, presiding officer, it's little wonder that each and every argument that the better together people have put forward is being batted out of the field and that opposition members are focusing solely on, cur on currency because it's the only tool they have left in the box and can speak of nothing else. Yet it is absolutely clear that if the UK government does not accept the common currency, then they will no longer be a petrol currency. And that will be, of course, detrimental to the rest of the UK. So, presiding officer, it is very you clear close, that please. Scotland can be an independent country, and I look forward to it being so. Thank you. Now call on Willie Rennie to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I admire Maureen Watts' passion. She clearly believes that national independence is something that she wants and Scotland deserves, and I admire and respect that. Uh, but when it comes to defending Scotland against an allegation that's never, ever been made, she is defending something that is just a fabrication. We have never said... Nobody has ever said that Scotland is too poor, too wee and too stupid. That allegation has never been made. And the fact that Maureen Watt was unable to come up with one person who has said that is clear evidence that she's defending Scotland against something that does not exist. And therefore, I believe that this passion is passion to a fault. It's passion that is leading nationalists to believe that they should never, ever question the concept of independence, whether it's on corporation tax, on shipbuilding or on the pound. They refuse to accept there are any weaknesses in their argument. And I propose today to take the Chamber through some of those arguments to try and flush some of them out. Firstly, on the... Certainly. Are the weaknesses are in his argument. Uh, Will he it? <laughs> Jimmy D says... Just the main ones, just the main ones. That I'm going to proceed this afternoon to set out the positive case for the United Kingdom because that is what Maureen Watt is also arguing that Better Together should make, and that's something that I will do this afternoon. First of all, on the currency. The currency is one of the most successful parts of the apparatus of the United Kingdom. It means that a business here in Scotland can trade right across the United Kingdom with limited barriers, with no transaction costs. And that means that they have got a great opportunity to expand their business. And what the United Kingdom parties have clearly said 
is that if Scotland goes independent, then the currency arrangement changes. The, uh, for three simple reasons. Firstly, on the temporary nature of the currency, as is proposed in the White Paper. The, we've seen in the Czech Republic and Slovakia that within weeks of that shared arrangement being set up, it collapsed. So we see the dangers of the temporary nature of a currency. The one-way insurance policy that has also been set out, which means that it expects the rest of the United Kingdom to stand as a financial guarantor to an independent Scotland, when that country would have no influence over what an independent Scotland would do. And the favour. The insurance policy could never be returned. Scotland being one-tenth of the size of the rest of the United Kingdom, it encourages a moral hazard. So therefore, the one-way insurance policy does not work. Secondly, sorry, thirdly, is the explicit desire to diverge the economies of the United Kingdom. We have a separate and growing economy in Scotland and apparently leaving behind the rest of the United Kingdom with aggressive policies such as a three pence cut in corporation tax and the three billion pounds extra borrowing. That again creates that extra tension in the currency that would pose significant difficulties. So those are solid reasons, good reasons as to why we are better off together in the United Kingdom. Now I know that John Swinney never admits he's long, wrong like his boss, but he thinks that he can play this dangerous game of bluff with the United Kingdom and believing that he is incapable, unwilling, it's not desirable to set out a plan B. But people want to know, and despite what Jamie Hepburn says, it comes up every single day when I'm out in the doors. Everybody is asking about the currency and they want to know the answer, but these people are refusing to answer the question. So my second point is on shipbuilding. We've seen today the order for the new, through, so three new offshore patrol vessels on the Clyde guaranteeing 800 jobs at BA Systems, one of the clear benefits of the United Kingdom. I was at the aircraft carrier launch in Rosyth to see one of the biggest ships the Royal Navy has ever built. Um, and it probably could be that these, no, no, it's now, the three um, new offshore patrol vessels could be the last orders that the Clyde ever receives if these people on these benches have their way. Because the facts are clear. The facts are clear and they shout in ball. But the facts are clear order, that Mr. no complex warships have ever been built outside the United Kingdom. And on that point, I'll take Mr Swinney to see if he's got an answer to this question. Well, John would, 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 would Mr Rennie just like to confirm that, that he's just issued on behalf of the United Kingdom government, just as his Chief Secretary called did this morning, a very clear threat to the people of Scotland mm -hmm. about the future of shipyards. Would you like to confirm that point? The threat so is really? quite clear that it comes from this government. Because this government is proposing to create a separate country. And no separate country from the United Kingdom has ever received an order of a warship, a complex warship. That has never happened. So Mr Swinney is posing the threat to the Clyde. No one else. He could withdraw his plans right now. But the reality is that he is more than keen to progress with this. in his last so, minute. On the final point is on corporation tax. We have been asking for months for the detailed analysis that Mr Swinney has made, apparently behind the scenes, but will refuse to publish, of what will they be the cost to the public exchequer of his plans for corporation tax. A cut of three pence more than anything a Tory Chancellor would do in Westminster. Anything. Three pence more. But he will refuse to set that out. And finally, I want to praise Mr Swinney on his opening remarks, where he praised the progress that the United Kingdom economy has made. The fact that we've got a, an extra 130,000 jobs in four years. In fact, that is probably much more than his plans and cooperation tax will ever achieve. So I thank him for praising a policy that he said would never work, draw to a but close, has resulted please. in masses of more jobs for Scotland. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I now call on Kenny Gibson to be followed by Neil Finlay.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. In today's debate has really thrown into contrast the difference between the aspirational case for a yes vote and the doom and gloom of the no campaign. I'll give you a wee quote from Michael Bertillo on the 28th of February, who said, and I quote, if we did get a referendum on Europe, the UK government would use the same tactics, tactics they're using in the Scottish referendum, scaring people rigid. And I think we've just had a wee example of what uh, Willie Rennie was trying to attempt there. And indeed, in terms of oil, which uh, Maureen Watt talked about, what was it uh, Lord Healy said on the 19th of May this year? We did underplay the value of the oil to Scotland because of the threat of nationalism. So we have had our economy underplayed by unions for many years. And a lot of these arguments were used against devolution referendums. It's just unfortunate Labour has now jumped on the union's bandwagon. Now, President Officer, I have no intention of talking about the currency in my speech. I was actually going to talk about the economic opportunities of independence. But before I move on to the meat of the debate, I do want to uh, move on, uh, switch to Sterling because so many of the unionists are obsessed. They think that's going to be the deal breaker. So let's look at what uh, Avinash Persaud, Emeritus Professor of Gresham College, Chairman of Intelligence Capital and a former Global Head of Currency Research at JP Morgan said on the 30, 31st of uh, July. What he actually said was, truth is usually the first casualty of political battles, but 25 years in currency markets tell me that the no campaigns argument that Scotland, Scotland cannot keep the pound is false. And he goes on to say, moreover, assuming Scotland continues to run a healthy external balance of payments, courtesy of 90% of UK's oil and gas being in Scottish waters and other foreign currency earners like whisky and tourism, sterling liquidity will likely flow from the rest of the UK to Scotland. Scot Scotland will be a net lender to England. And, uh, um, Malcolm Chisholm quoted uh, from the Finance Committee, but what did uh, Professor Andrew Hughes uh, Hallett actually he say? Uh, Hallett said, he said, and I quote, given independence, Scotland get, gets to add tax powers to the existing monetary setup. She would therefore be unambiguously better off. More policy instruments to serve the same targets, instruments that can now be designed to fit Scotland's specific needs rather than the UK average. And he went on to add, facing a tight general election in 2015, it's hard to believe that the UK government would, in fact, choose to deny a currency union when the consequences would be to make their own constituency worse off while Scotland was made better off. People don't usually voluntarily choose to shoot themselves in the foot. Mr Brown. Mr Brown. I'm grateful to the <coughs> member. Did anyone giving evidence to the Finance Committee, either written or verbal, support the Scottish Government's position that if there wasn't a currency union, they could simply walk away from the entirety of the debt? Mr. Gibson. David Simpson said in actual fact, and indeed Jim Cuthbert, Dr Jim Cuthbert, said Scotland should be compensated by the UK for all the oil money they've taken out of Scotland over uh, so many years. Uh, but uh, whilst the Financial Secretary explored the economic opportunities that would open up to an independent Scotland, unionist MSPs can only say what we can't do or hypothesise as to how it would all probably end in disaster. Far better, they say, to let Westminster keep calling the shots, and better, they say, not to take responsibility for Scotland's future into our own hands. It's all, always puzzled me that so many members in this chamber see, seem so unsure of their own ability and that of their colleagues that don't wish the powers to make Scotland a fairer and more prosperous society vested in this parliament. The ability to make our own choices and make decisions in the national interest would become normality for Scotland. Instead of remaining shackled to a political union with Westminster, where different priorities and policies and vested interests are entrenched. Independence will improve Scotland's economy by providing greater prosperity and opportunity for both businesses and citizens. And let me run through some of them in the two minutes I have left. By moving economic decision making, Scotland will have greater control over policy making in crucial areas like taxation, employment, immigration, exports, industrial policy uh, to provide more opportunities and improve our finances. We can improve the tax system by uh, being able to make it more efficient, more effective to support key growth sectors in Scotland, collect a fair amount of taxes to fund public services. Uh, increasing our prosperity and support stronger public services, as set out indeed by the Murleys Review. Opportunities for participation in company structures, improving labour relations can improve productivity, uh, productivity and economic output. Indeed, productivity can improve by up to 10%, as Scandinavia has shown. And we would uh, have a national convention on employment and labour relations to shape a new policy and a, and a fresh start with employee representation on boards to allow workers to contribute effectively alongside management. And Independent Scotland would ensure that we could control immigration. And of course, the great success of the Union in the 50 years since the war was to have net immigration of 2 million Scots 
If we go back to 1900, Scotland had the same population as the Netherlands. 16.1 million people now live in the Netherlands, showing the difference in their economic prospects over those years. And of course, immigrants, uh, students, for example, um, contribute £779 million annually, international students. And many of these, if we allow more people to come and study here, would want to stay and build our uh, economy. By diversifying manufacturing, investing more in research, Scotland can build on its industrial base. And of course, an industrial base, which in the 10 years of Tony Blair, lost 37% of all manufacturing employment in Scotland, 53% in Ayrshire, I should say. A Scottish government will provide greater support to this process in Westminster. And examples of industrial developments can include developing the Clyde for renewable activities similar to Belf in Belfast docks, developing the offshore technologies in the oil sector for international export, specialising in Scotland's chemical strength, computing life sciences, etc. But we need to have the full economic powers to develop an ambitious industrial policy to reverse decades of relative decline under Westminster mismanagement. A yes vote means business will have the full support of a global trading and investment network and greater opportunities to support Scottish SMEs who want to enter export markets and promote the unique strengths of Scottish business in key sectors. Also, an increase in, 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 uh, in uh, productivity would help to reduce inequality, reducing a low-wage society which does not provide an optimal environment for growth. So we must tackle inequality like countries like must Norway, Sweden, Denmark please. have done so successfully. I have so much more to say, but I was derailed by the sterling argument. But, uh, but thank you very much um, uh, for your patience, Presiding Officer. You will. <coughs> now, Colin Neil Finlay to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Six minutes or thereby. Please. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Central to the White Paper is the plan to create what the Scottish Government refers to as one of the most competitive business environments in Europe. And central to that aim is Mr Swinney's belief, and I see him just leaving the Chamber at this point, but his belief in cutting corporation tax. And he believes that this will create full employment as companies flock to Scotland's low-taxed economy. He wants to, create, he wants to cut corporate taxes to 3% below whatever level the UK sets. Now, if he does, a few things could happen. First of all, if Scotland did cut tax and this did attract foreign investment, and I certainly dispute whether that would happen, but let's imagine it did. Does he not think that England and Wales would follow immediately, wiping out his so-called competitive advantage? And then we would be back to square one. And all that he would have achieved is a reduction of £350 million in the the cash available for public services. In those circumstances, what does Mr Swinney propose? Well, according to the White Paper, he would cut by 3% below the rest of the UK again. And then the cycle would start all over again. And this would be followed by a subsequent race to the bottom in wages and terms and conditions too. Trickle-down economics has failed across the globe. Yet it is an experiment the Scottish Government want to repeat in an independent Scotland. I fear Mr Swinney has been reading too many of Mike Russell's books. And if this is such a great wheeze, then why are the Germans, the French, the Scandinavians and others not doing it too? The corporation tax rate in Germany is 30 per cent. In Norway, it's 28. Why are they not doing it? Even Professor Stiglitz, Alex Salmon's own economic advisor, said of this policy, and I quote, it's a gift to the corporations and will increase inequality in our society. James Daunt, the head of Watterson's Books, said in a moment, it's a dash to the bottom and it is insanity because personally, I think schools and hospitals are rather a good idea. Somebody has to pay for them. Uh, intervention. Uh, will, will you reflect on the fact that the previous Labour government gave a 10p corporation tax rate to life sciences companies that placed their research, innovation and intellectual property into the United Kingdom. Is that something which the Labour government should not have done and does he regret that decision? Neil Finlay. No one is arguing that at certain times in the economic cycle you adjust taxes. What we are arguing is that those taxes should be consistent across the UK to avoid tax competition. Does the Cabinet Secretary reject the comments of uh, Professor Stiglitz no, thank you, Professor Stiglitz and James Daunt. Or does he know something that they don't know? And can he point to anywhere in the world where lowering corporate taxes has created full employment, as he says it will? And, of course, the Cabinet Secretary is confident an independent Scotland will become a, a member of the European Union. Is he aware that, as a new member state, he would have to adhere 
to the 3% deficit limit. And the IFS says that we would have 5%. And what about the currency? Let's for a second drift off into the imaginary world where the Cabinet Secretary gets his way and we have a currency union. Mr Swinney has already accepted that this means a loss of sovereignty. Does he also accept that this would hand control and influence over the interest rates, borrowing, regulation and all other areas affecting the, the currency to what by then will be the central bank of another country, the Bank of England, and that the rest of the UK Chancellor would control that? Does he accept that with no politicians at Westminster, the rest of the UK would sign off our budget, want a say in our tax and benefit rates, and more in return for agreement to use the pound? What type of independence, no thank you, what type of independence would that be? And why would anyone want to sign up to that? Jim Sillers is absolutely right when he says the policy is stupidity and stilts. Has the Cabinet Secretary learned nothing from the Eurozone crisis where an attempt at economic union without political union has been disastrous for working people in Greece and Portugal and Spain and other countries? So I think we have a choice on September the 18th. We can keep the pound. We can avoid the mess that Sterling's own will bring. We can avoid our budget, tax rates, benefit rates and financial regulation being signed off by the Chancellor of another country. Or we can have the nonsense on stilts of the currency union. We can keep the Barnett formula and UK-wide redistribution where Scotland gets a greater share of public spending. Or with independence, we can scrap it. We can have progressive taxation and a 50p tax rate for those earning over 150,000. No mention of that from Mr Hepburn. Or we can cut taxes and public services whilst rewarding big business, something I would hope Mr Hepburn and those who regard themselves as the SNP left should be supporting, and yet we never hear a word from them on any of that. We can have a banker's bonus eh, tax to fund youth employment, or we can have the bankers keep their eye-watering bonuses, as Mr Swinney would have. We can use procurement rules to ensure contractors pay the living wage and end zero hours contract, or we can see the SNP vote that down again. And we can use existing services, or we can create, or we can spend hundreds of millions setting up new agencies. Remember, it cost 180 million to centralise the police. Surely, the estimate of 200 mil million to set up a whole new state is pie in the sky. These are the real choices we have on September the 18th, and I trust the Scottish people to make the right one. I trust them to vote no, and that will be a no for change. Thank you very much. And I now call on Mike McKenzie to be followed by Hugh Henry. Six minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, President Officer. There is no doubt, no doubt at all, that Scotland will be a successful and prosperous country after independence. And I would suggest that each and every member of the Unionist parties actually agrees with this. And yet they persist, and we've heard it this afternoon, they persist in talking Scotland's economic prospects down. Absolutely. And I would urge them to abandon the too poor and the too stupid arguments, because they're not only dishonest, they're offensive to everyone in Scotland. And I would ask them to consider the question instead, after independence, after independence, will they recognise the sovereignty of the Scottish people? Or will they continue to dig their political graves with their tongues? No, thank you, Mr Henry. And since 2007, the Scottish Government have shown that what can be achieved by good economic stewardship. In the economic race, we have competed more favourably than any other part of the UK except London. And we have done so without the full economic powers, without any fiscal powers, with both arms and one leg tied behind us, hopping on one foot. And all the while, Mr Swinney has maintained a balanced budget. Certainly. I'm, I'm, I'm quite puzzled. Um, Willie Rennie. Has, has Mike McKenzie stolen Jimmy Hepburn and Maureen Watt's speech? Mike McKenzie. <laughs> Great minds think alike. The question that we're addressing is, can we maintain this economic performance? Can we improve upon it after, after independence? I believe that yes, we can. Because having had a taste of good government, the Scottish people will accept nothing less. 
Yes, we can, because we in Scotland understand best the unique challenges and the opportunities of our economy better than anyone else, and for the first time of the powers required to improve this. And yes, we can, because the opposition parties in this chamber will be free from the need to take orders from London and will have the opportunity of genuinely putting their shoulders to the wheel, abandoning bad politics in favour of good economics. And in any case, presiding officer, it's not the often quoted headline statistics that are the only matter of economic importance. The sharing of that wealth is crucial. And Independent Scotland has been ranked at number 14 by the OECD. But for most people, it doesn't feel like a wealthy country. Scotland's enormous wealth isn't being shared equally. And this inequality in itself is a drag factor on our economy, limiting demand and limiting the success of our businesses. Inequality is a challenge we will be able to properly address after independence, and rather than denying that it exists, I hope the opposition parties will join us in the endeavour to make Scotland a fairer as well as a more prosperous country. There is a question too of what we do with this wealth in improving our quality of life. It is no coincidence that Orkney and Shetland, the only parts of the UK with oil funds, also happen to score very highly in UK quality of life surveys. This suggests to me that public goods rather than private goods contribute more to quality of life than the Westminster mindset can imagine. Devolution of 100% of the Crown Estate revenues, which will follow after independence, is a measure that will significantly tackle the regional inequality that has been faced by many of Scotland's island communities for many generations. So the only economic argument left in the Unionist arsenal is the sharing of risk, that somehow bigger is better. We have just experienced the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Being big didn't save the banks. Being big didn't save the UK. And being big didn't save the US. Indeed, many small countries, Norway and Denmark, for instance, didn't experience this crisis at all. And as for the sharing of risk, we all know how that works. The poor are made to pay for the failures of the rich. We're seeing that happening right now. That's how that so-called insurance policy has always worked. And that's not a policy that has ever served Scotland well. Presiding officer, three chapters of the White Paper, Scotland's Future, are devoted to the economy. It's a well thought out and a credible plan. It is informed by the thinking of the Council of Economic economic advisers, by a long stretch, the most formidable array of economic talent in the UK. In contrast, the No campaign have no plan before, beyond Project FIA. We certainly haven't heard an economic plan from the No plan from the No people this afternoon. And Project FIA is a plan that is offensive to many Scots who are sick of being patronised in this way by unionist politicians. With good political and economic and financial leadership, you draw to a officer, close? the scales are tipped heavily in favour of Scotland's pr prosperity and economic success after independence. Thank you. <coughs> now, Colin Hugh Henry to be followed by Colin Beattie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. 36 days until the pig in the poke referendum. 36 days until Scotland has been asked to have a leap in the dark. 36 days until Scots have been asked to vote on the basis of assertion, backed up with no evidence, on the basis of bluster from the First Minister, and on the basis that if we vote for them, everything will be all right on the night. But people actually do want answers, because it is a fundamental decision 
that they've been asked to make, one which affects every man and woman in Scotland, but one which affects their children and their grandchildren and generations to come. And a decision which, if we get this wrong, we cannot go back and say we made a mistake, we have changed our mind. We are stuck with the consequences forever. So it's right today that we have a debate on the economic implications of independence, a debate on what are the job implications, and we've heard about what will happen in the defence industry. We know that there are worries in the financial service industries, but we also know that there are other companies seriously considering what they will do if Scotland decides to separate from the United Kingdom. And it's right that we also look at what happens to prices, what happens to the money that we have to spend. And we know that, for example, companies like Tesco, which operate on both sides of the border in Ireland, actually charge more for the same goods in the Republic of Ireland than they do for those goods in the north of Ireland. And we know what the people who know the retail market best have already said. We know that the chief executive of Sainsbury's has said we and other retailers will take a view of what the cost structure is. There's no doubt Scotland is a more costly country in which to run a retail business. The chief executive of Morrison's, the, the, the burden of the cost structure in business, that would potentially have to be passed through consumer pricing because why should the English and Welsh consumer subsidise this increase of doing business in Scotland? And they are not the only ones. There are others who say much the same. And of course, the third element is currency. And I understand why Kenny Gibson doesn't want to talk about currency. I understand why they want to get off this debate, because they have no answers. But you know, currency affects every single thing that we do. Currency affects how we buy our groceries. Currency affects how we buy our house or pay for our rent. Currency affects us when we buy goods and services, wherever currency affects us when we go on holiday, wherever that is, currency impacts on every single aspect of our life. And yet, we do not know for certain what currency we would be using. Alex Salmon can give us his opinion. Alex Salmon can make assertions. But Alex Salmon cannot give us a guarantee about the currency that we would use, certainly. Can I, give I appreciate you uh, letting me ask, uh, ask uh, your question. Can, can you tell me what the no side believe the currency should be if Scotland votes yes? I don't believe that Scotland will vote yes, so yeah, why should I speculate? But if you were you know, correct in your assertion that, that Scotland was going to, to vote yes, then perhaps you should listen to some of the others in the nationalist ranks. Perhaps you, you, know, you should listen to some of your colleagues in the Yes campaign, because the Yes campaign has actually fundamentally split from top to bottom. We have the Scottish Socialists, who were founder members, telling us that we should have a Scottish currency. We have the Scottish Green Party telling us that we should have a separate currency. We have Dennis Canavan, the chair of the Yes campaign, telling us that we should have a separate currency. And yet, Alex Salmond is ignoring every single one of them. But it's not just in those other organisations, Mr Gibson, that people are saying that there should be a separate currency. There are others in the Scottish National Party, including in your Cabinet, who are saying the same thing. Now, I'll leave us... Well, rubbish, says Mr... Uh, uh, Paul Whitehouse. Rubbish, wheelhouse. Rubbish, he says. Well, OK. Um, I won't go into the issues that what, Mr, uh, what Mike Russell said about you know, abandoning social democracy, decimating the welfare state, putting up, uh, dropping taxes, issuing vouchers for education Mr. and hospitals. I will concentrate merely on what Mike Russell said about a separate currency. You say rubbish. Well, 
Mike Russell says that control of its own currency is a country's most potent economic weapon. It allows governments to control the money supply, interest rates and exchange rates, all of which can have a profound and relatively rapid impact on our economic growth and international competitiveness. And Mr Russell says, not me, so it's not rubbish that there are people in the SNP saying this, there are simply no other methods, says Mr Russell, by which the economy can be fine-tuned and geared to meet the ever-changing and accelerating challenges of the information age. And, as he puts it so eloquently, a country without its own currency is a country not only without a steering wheel, but also without brakes and As an accelerator. Close, so the nationalist camp is split. They are worried that Alex Salmond is leading them to doom. And, my, and, and we can understand why long-standing nationalists like Jim Sillers are so profoundly unhappy that they have been led up the garden path by a Scottish National Party that cannot deliver. If you could advise me if it is an order or if indeed if it is just a lack of courtesy that the government bring forward a debate on the economy. Their chief spokesperson uh, has been absent now for going into the fourth speech and there is no member of the economy team here. Is that an order or is it just a lack of courtesy to the chamber? Uh, it is not a point of order, but you put your point on the record. Thank you very much. I now call on Colin Beattie to be followed by Chick Brodie. Presiding officer, for too long now we've, been, we've seen a major imbalance between Scotland's economy, the Welsh, Northern Ireland and the regions of England's economies versus the South East of England. Indeed, the South East of England accounts for over half of the annual UK economic output. Eight out of ten jobs now created in the UK are in London. Now, Scotland's historically lost thousands of young people to the South every year. And this risk, risk remains, despite our current jobs market being comparatively better than most other areas. An unstable situation that is currently out of our hands, and one that in current circumstances inevitably creates a drag on attempts to improve our own economy. We know that Scotland's public finances are stronger than those of the UK. Since 1980, on average, we have run a public sector surplus. If we had been in charge of our own economy in that time, there's every chance our public finances would, according to the Scotland Means Business Report, prepared earlier this year by Bigger Economics, still be benefiting from a significant cumulative surplus. Another factor we must take into account is the frankly appalling levels of inequality in the United Kingdom. The UK is ranked 26th out of 29 advanced countries for inequality, clearly quite an alarming figure, but one that's perhaps unsurprising given the levels of increasing poverty thanks to Westminster's economic initiatives. Now, to take one example of this, the low paid lose out year after year due to Westminster's refusal to peg rises in the minimum wage to inflation. For comparison, 2010-11, Scotland ranked 16th out of 29 for inequality. And clearly, given our high levels of GDP, our strong public finances, and facts such as Scottish output per head being 10% above the UK average, not to mention oil and renewable energy resources, Scotland is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and the economic opportunities afforded to us by independence would provide the choices to make inroads into, into reducing inequality and to build a fairer society. We will be able to peg minimum wages to ensure the lowest paid are not cast further adrift, and we will, of course, take charge of our own welfare system thereby never having negative and unproductive measures such as the bedroom tax imposed on those who can least afford it. Let's not forget that Westminster still has many more spending cuts it wants to make, and independence is the only guarantee that we can choose not to impose these cuts. If Scotland was in charge of its own economy, we would design an economic policy tailored to Scotland and our, so our society's needs. This would benefit all sectors and ages in this country. We can transform our childcare system by providing the same number of hours of pre-primary education childcare as children receive in primary school at present. The economic knock-on effect of this will be that more parents, and women in particular, Ms. will have Mara, greater choices and career me. prospects, thus increasing both jobs and tax revenue. If the number of women in work increased by just 6%, tax revenues would rise by about £700 million. For those who are studying, 
We will certainly continue our policy of free education for Scottish students who study in this country, thus minimising the amount of debt Scottish students have when they embark upon careers. And for those who come here to study, we will have the opportunity in an independent Scotland to examine the reintroduction of the post-study work visa, which Westminster abolished without considering Scotland's economic needs. Independence would put the Scottish welfare system back in Scottish hands. Cutting the bedroom tax would put roughly £50 a month back into the hands of over 80,000 households. Every penny counts at a time when increasingly many of our poorest people are relying on food banks, and Westminster's planned rollout of universal credit is only going to make matters worse. By ensuring that, by ensuring that the most vulnerable of our society have the financial support they need, our economy will be stable from the ground up. The ability to provide a fair and stable pension is another opportunity independence provides. The UK has one of the worst records of state pension provision in Europe. Like the welfare system, Westminster ignores Scotland's differing needs in terms of life expectancy. Indeed, it's more than likely that the state pension age will be raised to 70 if we remain part of the United Kingdom. The Scottish Government intends to increase the state pension by at least 2.5% for the first independent Scottish Parliament. It's a start. Scottish pensioners will no longer be left alone to struggle to make ends meet. We would also finally have the ability to set up an energy fund for future generations, a step successive UK governments have never taken due to the lack of long-term vision at Westminster level. Scotland has over 60% of oil reserves of all of the EU, not to mention the second highest gas reserves. And companies in the energy industry are planning to invest more than £100 billion in the years to come. Having our economy in our own hands would protect the oil and gas industries from unexpected tax hikes by Westminster. An independent Scotland would provide stability in the environment to encourage long-term investment in oil and gas. And over the past few years, energy bills have constantly risen for consumers and businesses alike. Independence can help us get the choices to stop and reverse this trend. Taking control of our own tax system would allow us to encourage business and investment. And unlike the very limited tax powers being suggested by opposition parties, an independent Scotland's tax regime would mean Scotland could choose to cut business rates, making it an attractive country for companies to retain their headquarters in and improving the opportunities for career progression. This logic speaks for itself. In Midlothian North, within my own constituency... I'm afraid you must come to a close, please. Clearly, independence will bring us the opportunities we need to ensure our economy is stable and competitive while providing a solid foundation so the most vulnerable are not left behind. Independence gives us the means to ensure Scotland's economy is run by Scottish voices for the betterment of the Scottish people. Thank you very much. I now call Chick Brodie to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd say at the start, I thought when Mr Finlay was talking about books, he was about to tell us he got an economic book for his holidays. He hasn't filled it in, coloured it in yet. It was Bill Clinton's. <laughs> it was Bill Clinton's team of advisers who said that the key to winning the, his first election was it's the economy, stupid. And just as that has provided the basis of his victory, uh, so will it be the basis of securing uh, Scotland's independence. Several events show we are on the way, but that we can and will do even more. Last week. Uh, under the stewardship of Murdo Fraser in the EET committee, we met senior people involved in social enterprises, of which there are now 509 in Glasgow alone, and where Scotland is one of the global leaders. That same day in the evening, I hosted a reception on crowdfunding, where we learned that the participation of investors, small investors and clients in that process means that Edinburgh and Glasgow is now hot on the heels of London. Both situations, among, among many, demonstrate the wielding of economic strength and power and opportunities that arise from the people and from the grassroots. Additionally, as mentioned, the Chief, Exe Chief Economist's report last week highlight, uh, highlighted the strengthening of the Scottish economy, as did the Bank of Scotland report yesterday, because of the stewardship of the finances 2014, which will be the strongest year of growth since 2007, that despite the constraints, as we know, of budgets. But we still can and have to do more to achieve a fairer, more equal and participative Scotland when it comes to jobs and incomes. Presiding officer, though, great though the increasing economic con contribution of the grassroots is, and it is great, larger companies, B 
be it in life sciences, renewable energy, manufacturing, tourism, and so on, combine to confront the myths proposed to dispel Scotland's great economic opportunities. Myth one, and I'll do it briefly, the currency. In 2013, in Scotland, presiding officer, recognised by Scotland, recognised by authoritative financial uh, sources as potentially one of the richest co uh, countries in the world. In 2013, Scotland had a trade surplus of 2.8 billion pounds. The rest of the UK had a trade deficit of 29.5 billion pounds. Scotland's net fiscal balance, on average over the last 30 years, has consistently been better than the rest of the UK, as has its current budget balance. So a refusal to do a deal on Sterling Union will mean just one thing. It will be one, con one contributing factor only to the decline of Sterling or the currency of the rest of the UK. Myth two, a significant contributor to Scotland's economic opportunities is, of course, as Maureen Watt mentioned, oil and gas. The Chief Secretary of the Treasury keeps chanting his mantra that oil is declining. So let's turn it around, presiding officer. If that is the case, it will also, in the unlikely event of a no vote, it would then apply to a continuing UK government. Now, given that in 2011-12, UK net, net borrowings were £120 billion, £131.5 billion if you strip out Scotland's offshore contribution, in 2010-11, it was £149 billion, and in 2009-2010, £164 billion, applying the same uh, criteria. They have to tell us, in that scenario, unlikely though it may be, they have to tell us in the face of that myth of declining oil, they should tell us now whether they will make savage cuts or increase taxes to shore up its currency, to decimate its debt. No, I, I, I can't just say. We certainly know where these cuts will fall and it won't be on the bankers' bonuses. But of course, presiding officer, they know it's not declining. We had witnessed Mr Cameron's clandestine visit to the vast Clare Ridge oil field just two weeks ago, to the exploration of Tyree and the cover-up of oil production 30 years ago. That's production under production licence PL262 in the Lower Clyde and Atlantic margins in the early 80s. Such cover-up as acknowledged by, by Michael Heseltine. And the UK continues, the UK government continues to per perpetuate these myths and others because it knows. It knows that Scotland's contribution from food and drink, from general exports and from oil are required to reduce UK borrowings in an attempt to balance its books. Without Scotland, and then pulling out of Europe, I now will encourage my children to consider, along with other young people in the past who sought jobs in London and South East, to come home. And those that are being trained and skilled here to stay home. Because the opportunity to build a solid Scottish economy based on the economic strategy that embraces the strong sectors I have already mentioned will allow us to increase our, work, increase our working population and compete on employment and productivity. Young people, more apprenticeships, skills development, more women in management in their workplace will underpin the economic strategy. Presiding officer, during recess, I had the opportunity to meet innovators and business people from China, Norway and elsewhere who are attracted to invest in Scotland because they see, they sense the economic opportunities that exist here. In 2006-2007, 8% of inward investment jobs in the UK came to Scotland. In 2010-2011, it was 19%. In 2011-2012, it was 18%. You must come to a conclusion, please. And finally, presiding officer, I started with a quote from a US president. I end with a quote from another, the current one. Not only, not only can Scotland be a successful independent country, it will be a successful independent country. Yes, we can, and yes, we will. Thank you. I now call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Claire Adamson, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Perhaps I should start by uh, paraphrasing uh, Winston Churchill, who said it's always a challenge on such occasions to have to follow a really great speaker. Fortunately, today I only have to follow uh, Chick Brody. Um, <laughs> and Mr Brody, like many other speakers in this debate, talked a little bit about the issue of currency. And that's important because currency is at the heart of uh, how we take our economy forward. And nothing typifies the weakness 
of the SNP's case, better than its stance on currency. Now, we know that the SNP's stance is that there should be a currency union with the rest of the UK post-independence, not a stance shared by many other people involved in the Yes campaign, whether that be Patrick Harvey, Jim Sillers, Colin Fox, or even the chair, Dennis Canavan. And Mr Swinney and his colleagues continually assert that there will, of course, be a currency union post-Scotland and the rest of the UK, between Scotland and the rest of the UK, post a yes vote, because that is manifestly in the rest of the UK's interests. But that is not the view taken by the leadership of the three major Westminster parties. It is not the view taken by the people of the rest of the UK, who in successive opinion polls have said they do not want to share their currency with an independent Scotland, and nor is it the view of a whole range of experts. And when this Parliamentary uh, Economy Committee took evidence on this issue in the spring, we heard from a whole range of experts. Sir John Gee, former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, Professor Ronald MacDonald, Glasgow University, Dr Monique Ebel of NIESR, Professor David Bell of Stirling University, and the currency expert Dr Angus Armstrong. And all of these were quite clear in their view that a currency union, as proposed by the SNP, would not be in the interests of the rest of the UK. Now, I know that the committee also heard from Professor Anton Muscatelli of Glasgow University, who does, in fairness, take a different view. But he was very much a lone voice amongst those who gave us evidence. And the weight of expert opinion is contrary to what the SNP claim, and yet they still assert it as fact. So that leaves us with the question of Plan B. The First Minister seems to be hinting that the preferred alternative to currency union is sterlingisation, using the sterling without a formal currency union. But as was pointed out in an expert report last week, this would be disastrous for the financial services sector in Scotland, leaving us without a lender of last resort. There are some 115,000 people directly employed in the financial services sector in Scotland today. How many of these jobs would be retained if we went down this route? Now, the First Minister says it's our pound and we are keeping it. We've heard him say that the pound is an asset of the UK, which we are entitled to retain. And if it is denied a share, then we do not need to take on any of the liabilities. But this demonstrates a fundamental misunderstanding. Because a currency is not an asset. It is a means of exchange issued by an institution, in this case, the Bank of England. And if the people of, in Scotland vote to leave the United Kingdom, then they vote to leave its institutions behind. We might be entitled to a share of their asset value, but to claim that we retain a right to the Bank of England post a yes vote is as absurd as saying we retain a right to other institutions like the House of Commons, the House of Lords or the Ministry of Defence. Yes, I'll give way to Mr Brody. Check Brody. Mr Fraser, he's normally used to proving himself right through wit. This time he's shown himself only half right. Who do you think will carry out the negotiations on a currency union? You seem to attribute it to the UK government when in fact that rests with the board of the Bank of England. Mr Fraser. <laughs> A bizarre intervention from Mr Brody. These will be negotiations between two sovereign governments who, of course, will be answerable to their electorate. As I've already said, the latest poll said 68% of the population of the rest of the UK do not want to countenance a currency union with an independent Scotland. And what would, what, what would Scotland walking away from the share of UK debt actually mean? Writing in this weekend, Scotland on Sunday, Bill Jamieson put it better than I ever could. It would be an act of national financial suicide, branding Scotland as an untrustworthy borrower and wreaking havoc with our claims to fiscal probity. Angus Armstrong addressed this point when he appeared before our committee and was clear there were two substantial downsides to Scotland defaulting on a share of UK debt. Firstly, the impact on borrowing costs. International investors would regard an independent country which has just repudiated its debt share as a poor risk. The consequence of that would be much higher borrowing costs in Scotland than at present, representing a real financial burden on businesses and ordinary families across the land. Secondly, in the words of Angus Armstrong, the precedent that would be set for the rest of Europe would be extraordinary. Any part could unilaterally have a referendum on independence and have no debt. There are lots of places in Europe that would like to do that. People have to think about the broader consequences of that. And Dr Armstrong is absolutely right to highlight this concern. Because imagine the consequences for debt-laden countries like Italy or Spain if a president were established that parts of them could vote to leave without taking any debt with them and then presumably think they can waltz into EU membership without difficulty. Nothing would be more likely to provoke a veto on Scottish accession to the EU than that. 
Now, I'm sure these are the arguments that weighed heavily with the Fiscal Commission when its members failed to support the Scottish Government's stance on debt, although we await hearing with interest from Mr Beveridge when he makes a speech on Monday his answers to these questions. The fact is the SNP's stance on currency is a total shambles. And don't just take my word for it. Listen to what the party's former Deputy Leader Jim Sillers has said. I have a lot of sympathy for the view that the logical position to take is that an independent country should have its own currency, perhaps one in a currency board arrangement with the rest of the UK. But that is not what is on offer here. Instead, we are being offered something impractical, unworkable and increasingly incredible. You must try to close. And all this matters, Deputy Presiding Officer, because people need to know the currency in which their wages will be paid, in which they will pay their mortgages and where businesses will make their loan repayments. Presiding Officer, we need to hear from this Scottish Government what their preferred alternative to currency union is. And until it tells us, its economic plans are totally without credibility. Thank you. Claire Adamson to be followed by Elaine Murray, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 18th of September, the Scottish people will be given um, a chance to vote and answer the question, should Scotland be an independent nation? And the Yes Camp have made a very positive case for why Scotland indeed should be an independent nation. And the other camp, the Better Together Camp, have just given us um, a, a bunch of fear stories and a negative um, assessment of, of Scotland's opportunities of independence. But better together always leaves me with a question, and it's one I would ask the Scottish people who are still undecided that they should ask themselves. Better for whom? We're not better together for the people affected by the bedroom tax. We're not better together for those who are using food banks. And we're certainly not better together for those experiencing the indignity of workability assessments. No, thank you. But what I question most about the whole situation at the moment is how we can possibly be better together in a country whose overriding economic trend is to one of wider inequality. That means lack of social mobility, low wages, low productivity and an economic model that will lead us to a less prosperous country. No, thank you. On the 14th of July this year, the BBC analysis programme on the radio broadcast um, a, a, an episode called the, the End of the Pay Rise? Question mark. And it states, something strange has been happening to the British economy. Over six years now, wages have fallen for most of us, which is unprecedented in British modern history. And despite the return of economic growth, wages have not picked up. So what has happened? And crucially, is, a long -term, is this a long-term problem and is it the end of the pay rise? There are many contributors to the programme, including Paul Johnson, the Director of the Institute of Fiscal Studies, not someone I would normally quote in this chamber, I have to say. But it does explore the direction that, that the UK is going in, in terms of wages and the prospects for people on low wages in our economy. And it's not just the BBC and analysis who have raised these concerns. The CIPD, the um, professional body of the HR uh, in, in the UK and internationally, um, published a megatrends document, um, which is the trends in shaping of work and working lives. And they indeed asked the same question. Have we seen the end of the pay rise? And the key summaries for this doc document make worrying, worrying reading for people who are living in the UK. Since January 2009, average weekly earnings, including bonuses, have fallen by 8%. It also states that the pattern is widespread across workforce affecting women in public, private sectors, women and men, all parts of the UK and most industries. It's a drop in real earnings that has been slightly greater at the top of the earnings distribution than at the bottom. And it's even worse for self-employed people. They've seen an even bigger drop in real-term average earnings of some, sometimes between 20 to 30 per cent in the three years from 2010 to 2011. And what the analysis programme and what this document shows them is if we continue on the US model of a low-wage economy, low-productivity low, um, economy, the, which most of the economic experts tell us the UK is heading at the moment, we will end up in the position of the US and between 2008 and 2012, the average earnings fell in real times in many OCD countries, 
In fact, five of those who have of which their data are no thank you. But in the USA, real earnings for medium full-time workers are no higher in 2013 than they were in 1979. If we continue on the road to low productivity, low wage economy and inequality in the UK, then we will end up with a situation as in the UK and ask that question, better together from whom? Not for ordinary workers who are living and working in the UK context at the moment. And what's really interesting about some of this analysis and the, the HR study does is it does look and ask the question about who this is most affected across the OECD countries. And it's no surprise that when you look at the current situation and they ask the question of employees, if you compare your current situation with that of January 2009, have you experienced a change in the following aspects of your work, your salary? And those who have experienced an increase in salary, not surprisingly, include Denmark, Netherlands, Finland, Norway and Sweden. Those small northern European countries with similar prospects to Scotland as an independent nation who continue to buck the trend of, ec of the economics, who reduce inequality in their, their countries and are developing a model that can go forward. Presiding officer, we just heard the cultural conference um, in this um, parliament this weekend. And Simon Arnold of East Anglia University uh, presented a very interesting um, a table of um, analysis done about how good a country is. And despite some of the disparaging comments from Better Together representatives about our, some of our neighbours like Ireland and Iceland, the Good Country Index, which measures not what country does at home, but what it does is greater good to the wider world, the one that tops that table is the Republic of Ireland. Must and not surprisingly please. again, in the top five we have Finland, Switzerland, Netherlands, Denmark, countries of which we can aspire to have a similar inequality, a progressive economic model and prosperous future for our country. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call Elaine Murray to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Now, nobody here has been arguing that Scotland couldn't be an independent country. The only people I've ever heard saying that Scotland could be too poor, too weak, too unsuccessful are members of the SNP. Nobody else I've ever heard on the union side has ever said that. I think the success of the Scottish uh, economy under separation is maybe more questionable. And the questions are there because of the lack of answers that we're getting from the S side, where people are not getting the answers they want. But the question, as the Cabinet Secretary himself has said, it is should Scotland be independent or indeed would Scotland be more successful with a devolved parliament with increased powers within the United Kingdom? The argument still seems to the yes is still putting forward are the assertions of the Scottish Government with all the uncertainty they, they, they seem to be unable to resolve. Now, I have spent many, many, many hours on the doorsteps of residents of Dumfries and Galloway over the last several months, it feels like, and I've been listening to their views. And there are some who remain undecided, but what they tell me is they are not getting enough information about how separation or independence would work. They're not getting the answers they seek about what would actually happen. And they are not interested in being told that page 110 or whatever of Scotland's future will explain it all. They want straightforward answers to questions about currency, about how the, all the aspirations in the white paper will be paid for and what will be the effects on the local economy. And the, local, you know, the effect on the local economy is very important to people in, in my constituency because of our links with Carlisle and Cumbria. Those are very important to us, both economically as, and socially. Carlisle is, by a long way, our nearest city. We have much greater connectivity with Carlisle than we have with any city in Scotland. My constituents use it, Carlisle, for leisure, shopping, access to more of the rail work, for work. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a whole m m barrage of reasons why people do not want to be separated from Carlisle. People in the east of my constituency access medical services in Carlisle. Businesses in Gretna, for example, operate on both sides of the border. 
Many of the tourists who, do, who visit Dumfries and Galloway come from Northern England and the Midlands. And in fact, these areas are actually targeted because, in local tourism campaigns because they are such a strong source of visitors. So it is highly surprising that the links across the border are so important to my constituents. And I, the reason why I believe a substantial majority of my constituents will vote no on September, or the 18th of September. And there is no way that those links would be improved under independence. But devolution, I believe, actually does offer further opportunities. Now, members of this chamber may not be aware uh, of the work of the UK Common Select Community or Committee on Communities and Local Government, which last month published a very interesting paper on the potential for devolution in England, and specifically on fiscal devolution to cities and city regions, giving those cities and city regions, created through local authorities working together, additional tax varying and spending powers. Now, there are some limited examples already functioning through the city deal, but what, be, what is being proposed by the Select Committee goes much further. The committee was composed of Labour, Conservative and Liberal Democrat MPs, and those, those MPs are urging these proposals to be taken forward in the next Westminster Parliament, starting next year. So I hope the parties are listening. Yes, certainly. Kenneth Gibson. Your intervention. Um, talking about devolution, what do you say to Professor Peter McGregor, who told the Finance Committee that Labour's devolution proposals are higher taxes in Scotland than England, which uh, Mr Finlay wouldn't let me uh, ask him about, uh, it would cost the Scottish economy uh, £4.6 billion a year and 75,000 jobs. And the only way that could be averted would be to reduce the wages of public sector workers. You can look it up on the Finance Committee website if you have I, I, I wish I hadn't taken that, because it's a diversion from what I'm trying to argue about my uh, own constituents. Now, I know that government M NSPs like Kenny Gibson think what is happening in England is completely irrelevant, but actually it could be extremely important to the south of Scotland, so long as we remember, remain part of the United Kingdom. Additional powers are already being devolved to Scotland in 2016, as we all know, and all three UK main parties have agreed that further powers will be devolved. No, I won't, because I, the, the previous one went on far too long. There are differences between the parties' proposals, uh, as should be expected. However, the transfer of power from Westminster to Holyrood shouldn't be in order to consolidate power here, something that this particular government doesn't seem to understand. We too should be considering how powers can be further devolved more locally. And it's in that devolution of power where I think there's an opportunity for Dumfries and Galloway to work with the authorities in Carlisle and Cumbria with more port power to develop the regional economy. I, I consider that to be a huge opportunity for the Solway Basin, and it can't happen if both sides are are in separate country, even if there wasn't a physical border, that sort of collaboration wouldn't take place because actually we know that one of the consequences of devolution in the south of Scotland is that cross-border working hasn't taken place to the same extent as it Order, did prior please. to 1999. And I think that cross-border co cooperation needs to be reinstated if we are to take the city of Carlisle region, which actually Dumfries and Galloway is part of, uh, forward. Devolution on both sides of the border offers that opportunity. But I do not believe that separation, I believe it will, will could possibly offer that opportunity. It will kill it store, stone dead. Because if we have separation, I'll tell you what will happen in Dumfries and Galloway. It will remain a forgotten corner of Scotland, cut off from Carlisle, with no strong links to any Scottish city. And I have said on several occasions that if the people of Scotland vote yes, I will respect that decision, and I will, but I will have serious reservations about the effects on my constituents, because I genuinely cannot see how separating from the rest of the United Kingdom, and Car Carlisle and Cumbria in particular, can have any, uh, any economic benefit benefit to Dumfriesshire. Now, I make no apologies for being parochial uh, in my contribution because I was elected to represent the interests of my constituents, and it is my firm belief that separation from our closest neighbours in Carlisle and Cumbria cannot be in their interests, and I believe that is the reason why my constituents will be voting resounding no on the 18th of September. Thank you. I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Margaret McDougall. Uh, like uh, Elaine Murray, I'm going to be a bit of a parochialist, but I'm also going to be an internationalist. Um, the people in my constituency earn their living in a variety of ways. Fishing is a long-run industry. We, over the years, have been the biggest whaling port in the world, and people travel to the other end of the world. Today, we have Europe's biggest whitefish port, and we are significant in the pelagic industries as well. Many of my constituents work offshore in the oil and gas industry, and increasingly they're getting involved in the offshore renewable industry. Agriculture is a very significant industry. We deliver the finest beef in the world, not only in Scotland, but beyond and around the world. And we have significant engineering interests. 
So how are these various interests served by the present arrangements? And could they be better in an independent Scotland? We in Scotland have the longest coastline of any country in Europe. In fact, to give you a sense of how long it is, China's coastline is only 50% longer than Scotland's. So we are essentially a country with extensive and important maritime interests. What that requires, of course, when you have maritime interests, is that you have the ability to defend these maritime interests. Do the present arrangements provide for adequate defence? We heard that there are going to be three new small vessels to protect the UK's coastal interests. Where are they to be based? Here is a picture of the total number of vessels in the Royal Navy protecting our maritime interests that are based in Scotland. Now, this is not just a theoretical debating point. In January this year, the Kuznetsov, the biggest capital ship in the Russian Navy, built in Odessa in the late 1980s, nearly 60,000 tonnes, with squadrons of Sukhov 27s, with Antonov 41s, with helicopters, with surface-to-air missiles, with seven varieties of radar for detecting threats to its integrity, and 2,000 sailors on board, was moored so close in of my constituency's coast that even with my eyes, with hypermetropia, myopia, presbyopia, low light myopia and astigmatism, only one sight defect to go and I'll have the full set, I could see the Kuznetsov. Legally moored in the Murray Firth, outside the 12 mile limit, but inside an area of economic interest of 200 miles. You could see beyond it, further out, the Beatrice oil platform. So that's how close in it was, and we could all see it. How did the Royal Navy know the Kuznetsov was there? Well, the Russian sailors have caught up with the modern world, and one of them advertised the presence of the Kuznetsov via Twitter. And believe me, on the case at once, the Ministry of Defence spotted it and dispatched a vessel to protect our maritime interests. And in only 38 hours, it got there to see what was going on. Now, of course, how can it be done better elsewhere? Ireland has eight vessels around its coast. It's just increased from seven to eight. Distributed around its rather shorter coastline, that smaller, less economically powerful country. Ireland, too, has a couple of aircraft. Could have gone out and sniffed and hovered over the top and seen what's going on. Our Nimrods, history, unreplaced. The Kuznetsov is also an aircraft carrier, and as I said, it's got aircraft on it, and that's slightly different from the UK situation. <laughs> now, other interests. Agriculture. We have the lowest support for our farmers of any country in Europe. Not because money wasn't provided by the European Union to help our farmers in more disadvantaged areas, but because the UK government kept that money, which only came to the UK because of the special circumstances of agriculture in Scotland, where 85% of our land is less favoured area. South of the border, 15% is less favoured area. We suffer in agriculture because we're part of the current union. We could do so much better. Fishing, oh, if only I had an hour or two on that subject. We have seen a fishing industry suffer every time the UK represents fishing in Europe because the priorities of the Scottish fishing industry are not the priorities of the United Kingdom where we're representing ourselves. Even if our own minister occasionally got to speak in Europe, we would do better. An independent Scotland would certainly do better beyond per adventure. We've heard a lot about currency, and it is important. But even more important is our economy. The currency is secondary to our economy. 
If we don't get our economy right and we don't have a government that represents our economy's interests, my constituents will continue to suffer the effects of the United Kingdom. It's time with independence so my constituents and people across Scotland can be properly supported in their economic endeavours. Thank you. Before we move on, can I remind members that the use of props is not allowed in the Chamber? There are many reasons for this, but one of the reasons is that the official report cannot then record proceedings properly. I call Margaret McDougall to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have listened with interest to the debate across the Chamber today, and I would suggest a more appropriate title might be The Economic Uncertainties of Independence. With just 36 days left till the independence referendum, the people of Scotland lack key information on how independence would work. Lacking information about currency, start-up costs, pensions and taxation. Far from being an opportunity, it appears to be a leap into the unknown. So I'm going to focus my speech today on the two major issues of currency and taxation. On currency, it's been clear that a current, it's been made clear that a currency union, the preferred option of this government, is off the table. No matter how many times Alex Salmon repeats it's Scotland's pound, it is not going to change the fact that if the rest of the UK does not want a currency union with Scotland, we can't force them into one. Even if a currency union was still on offer, it would effectively mean handing the key fiscal levers of the economy over to the central bank of another country, while losing our political union and influence. Sterlingisation is an even less attractive option. No one is denying that Scotland could use the pound, but without a currency union, we would be left without a lender of last resort. It's just not credible. According to the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, this would have a knock-on effect to Scotland's financial sector, creating a financial border where banks would be forced to move their head offices to the country in which the central bank was located. The financial sector exports generate 9% of Scottish GDP, so this would be a huge loss to our economy. It's perplexing that the party that pushed for this independence referendum a party established in 1934 to fight for Scottish independence seems to be fighting so hard against a Scottish currency, instead proposing a currency union while stripping away the political union which makes our currency union work. So without a clear plan on currency, there is no opportunity, only uncertainty. Uncertainty for Scottish businesses, uncertainty for Scottish banks, and uncertainty for the Scottish people, in effect, no answers, no credibility, no thanks. The plan, or lack thereof, on taxation is even more worrying. When I asked Mr Spinney last week if taxes would need to increase to pay for things promised with a yes vote, he replied, and I quote, the answer is no, taxes will not have to go up to pay for independence. However, the Institute for Fiscal Studies economist David Phillips tells us that an independent Scotland could expect to be running a deficit of around 5% of GDP in 2016-17, which would be larger than that facing the UK as a whole and would, be, would necessitate tax rises or spending cuts. While Professor Joe Armstrong of this I'll take an intervention. Kenneth Gibson. Allow me to make an intervention. Uh, what's your view on the Institute of Fiscal Studies telling the Finance Committee on the 5th of March that UK government departments up to 2019 will face a 17.1% cut in their budgets and what will the impact on Scotland? Margaret McTiggle. Well, I wasn't uh, party to that conversation, so I'm not going to um, make comment on it. Professor Joe Armstrong of the Centre for Public Policy for Regions told the EET committee that there are opportunities, but we either increase taxes or cut spending, given that we have a fiscal deficit and potentially limits on how much additional borrowing we can make. Yet there are no signs of any tax increases or spending cuts in the SNP's plans. 
Instead, we are promised tax cuts and spending increases. So I ask the same as I did last week. How are we paying for increased spending? The money saved from scrapping Trident must have been spent at least times over by now. We know that oil and gas is finite and volatile, and city group states, with the recent drop in oil revenues, Scotland's fiscal deficit is now significantly above UK levels. This is fantasy economics. Cuts proposed in private while still maintaining publicly that it will be all right on the night. Just vote yes. Yet impartial expert bodies such as the IFS tell us we would need to make cuts almost immediately. Is it any surprise that the latest polling shows support for no Order, at 55 per cent, while yes is at 35 per cent? People are rejecting the separatist agenda, seeing the opportunities of devolution because we have 300 years of shared experience, history and joint endeavour. To conclude, presiding officer, Scotland can stand up and lead the UK, not stand up to leave it. Our economic, social and political union offers us strength and security, while devolution means we can forge our way forward, with more powers coming with the Scotland Act and even more after a no vote. Scotland doesn't need independence to stand on its own two feet. We already do. I don't want to break away from my brothers and sisters in the rest of the UK. I want to tackle inequality and injustice wherever it arises. And on the 18th of September, I will be voting to strengthen our ties, not to cut them. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Roger Campbell. And after that, we will turn to the closing speeches. Mr Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This has been a lengthy debate with some interesting contributions. Ultimately, however, this debate is between those who value opportunities and rise to challenges, as opposed to those for whom the glass is always half empty, even when it is crystal clear, as is now widely acknowledged, that Scotland can be a successful independent country. A small country like Scotland has an abundance of opportunity laid out before it. We need to make sure we take advantage of it. One example of how we could do that is set out in the Scottish Government's jobs plan for an independent Scotland. The plan builds on the white paper, in my view, and sets out how we can make Scotland's wealth work to create jobs and opportunities. And as an independent member state of the EU, it's clear that Scotland would have a number of different priorities from those of the UK. We already have different priorities from Westminster in many areas, such as fishing, farming and energy, to which my colleague Stuart Stevenson has already referred. Independence, I believe, will allow Scotland to replicate the approach of other small states, such as Denmark, Ireland and others, on how to approach negotiations in the EU effectively, forming alliances when and with whom it suits us to do so, sometimes working with the rest of the UK, sometimes working with others, whether that be on fishing, farming or even arrest warrants and student visas. I turn now, if I may, to the first report of the Fiscal Commission. No, sorry, I'm going to press on. Uh, much referred to in relation to comments on currency. What I found impressive in the Fiscal Commission report was their conclusion that under the Union, in terms of economic growth, Scotland has underperformed relative to both the UK and other small countries, including Austria, Denmark, Sweden, Ireland and Portugal. And in the 30-year period to 2007, we have had an annual percentage growth of 2.3 compared to 2.8% for the UK as a whole. And that growth rate has been broadly similar since. In the longer term, as the Fiscal Commission reports, however, growth depends on productivity, and in that respect, the UK record remains poor. Although Scotland has closed the relative gap with the rest of the UK, we remain behind key competitors such as the USA, Germany and France, as John Swinney has already made reference to. And I recognise, of course, that in terms of growth, we need to make it clear that we need to have the right balance of growth so that we have growth that reduces inequality. We also have a, had a lack of growth in population historically, as Kenny Gibson referred to it earlier on, particularly as compared to the rest of the UK. That lack of growth has seemed to change in recent years. And we know, of course, that a modest increase in the numbers of people, particularly young people, staying in Scotland each year could have, had, have a significant impact, not only on dependency ratios, but on growth itself. And we know that while Professor Stiglitz may not be a fan of reducing corporation tax, he concludes that countries which are more unequal do not do as well, do not grow as well, and are less stable. In the debate today, speakers such as Jamie Hepburn of 
talked eloquently of the nature of inequality in Scotland. And whilst I accept there is no guarantee that an independent Scotland will be a more equal society, I think there's every prospect that it will be. Indeed, some of the no campaigners seem to be positively fearful of it. Independence, presiding officer, gives us a unique opportunity to change the kind of society we are. On Saturday, I met a voter in my constituency voting yes because he wanted to see a revolution in Scotland's health record, which in his view would have, have, would have a knock-on economic effect. Independence offered opportunities for him which he believed the status quo simply does not offer, let alone taking account of the impact of privatisation of the NHS down south. And when we speak of the risks of independence, let's also remember the letter to the Financial Times last week from Jim Spowart and others, that those seeking to evaluate risk in the financial sector must take account of the far more significant risk posed to the financial services by the prospect of a UK exit from the European Union. And let's, let's not also never forget the key mantra of the Westminster Government in this referendum campaign. No pre-negotiation, they say. That, of course, fits very nicely with an agenda raising doubts and uncertainty as a key campaigning tool, which we've heard in this chamber today. But no pre-negotiation means there can be no definitive answers on many key issues. But it's on the currency issue alone that the Westminster Government has decided to make the position known. In that spirit of giving the facts to the Scottish people on this very important issue, this, of course, is not pre-negotiation. That's what they say, and obviously because they say so, that's right. Order, Just... Mr Campbell, could I stop you for a moment? I'd be grateful if members in the Chamber could listen to the speech that's being made, please, on all sides of the Chamber. Roderick Campbell. OK. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just as it's right that the opposition parties will fight to the death following a yes vote to ensure a currency union, because that's the best for Scotland, we can only assume that because why we've heard nothing else about a plan B in the event of a yes vote from them. Finally, I, I see that there was a reference earlier on to currency bluffs, but it's Henry McLeish, not a known supporter of the SNP, who took the view, I think, in a, a statement that the currency bluff is entirely political and consistent with the unionist campaign. The people of Scotland, presiding officer, have a lot to weigh up over the next few weeks. They have time to reflect on where opportunities arise. And I'm sure in this part of the chamber, at least, and, and elsewhere in Scotland, thousands of activists will continue to make the case for the opportunities of independence. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. And we now turn to the closing speeches. And I call on Gavin Brown, please, with six minutes or so. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, I think the, the attitude of the Scottish Government towards the referendum and, indeed, its governance in general, was really encapsulated in one minor exchange at the very start of this debate. Not a, an exchange that was central to the debate, but an exchange that I think does demonstrate the approach of this government. Jerry Mara asked the Cabinet Secretary a question about unemployment, a question as about why it was higher currently in Scotland than it was in the rest of the UK. If it's lower in Scotland, the Scottish Government releases press release yes. after release. They hold press conferences, and it is the very start of every single speech in exchange the First Minister or the Cabinet Secretary makes. If unemployment is higher in Scotland, then it's something that ought to be ignored. Mm. It's something that not to be taken too seriously, and it's just a blip in the figures. If the figures support their case, they are the most important figures on the planet, but anything which attacks or weakens their argument whatsoever ought to be completely ignored and is totally irrelevant. Now, we've had some bizarre, some bizarre admissions in this debate. I'll take the point, sure. Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I'm a bit bewildered by Mr Brown's remark, given that every single month the government issues a press release mm -hmm. about the labour market statistics, regardless of what the labour market statistics say, every single Both month. month. So I just don't understand the point that he's just made. Gavin Brown, I'll allow uh, you allow your time Allow me to assist back. the Cabinet Secretary, because in a month when unemployment is lower in Scotland, the most important figure to look at is the headline unemployment figure. If it happens to be higher in Scotland in that particular month, it's something that's buried away at the bottom of the press release and actually is one of the less important aspects of the economy. But let's, but let's return to the central aspects of this debate. Let's return. If Mr Swinney wishes to intervene, I'll take an intervention at any point. He doesn't have to shout from the sidelines, Deputy Presiding Officer. The key argument put forward again by the Scottish Government is that we need to vote for independence to stop austerity. 
They genuinely try to claim that if we were to be independent, there would be no cuts in public spending. There would be no tax increases. Indeed, there would be tax cuts. There would be welfare increases. You would be able to retire younger. And at the same time, there would be an oil fund. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who have been quoted, I have to say, after SNP member, after SNP member today to support their case, said this. If an independent Scotland want to, wanted to have sustainable public finances, they would have to have greater spending cuts and or tax rises on top of every single one planned by Westminster. We would have a greater fiscal deficit than the, the rest of the UK, not just in year one of independence, but for each year after that. Now, members shake their head. If they want to stand up and show me an independent, well-respected expert who have suggested that we would have a smaller deficit than the rest of the UK, then I will take that intervention happily, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, the Scottish Government claim that everything will be fine with economic growth were we to separate. But I posed the questions at the, at the start to the Scottish Government. What are the industries that are suddenly going to start coming to Scotland because we become independent? And we have heard none. Perhaps Mr Brodie is going to enlighten us at this late stage. I intend, to, I intend to do so. I wonder if Mr Brown could give his reaction to the announcement today that Acre Solutions has announced a £150 million investment to move into new premise, premises in DICE agreeing to a lease of up to 35 years, 35 years, uh, with the potential to create hundreds of jobs in the Gavin end Brown. I'm not, I'm not, he, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced please. that enlightened me or anyone else, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I don't think they're coming to Scotland because we are going to be independent. Uh, I, I'd have thought they're coming anyway, uh, given the state of the polls at the moment. They may not, they might think we might not become independent. They can't suggest the industries that are going to suddenly come. They can't suggest the industries that are deeply held back by being part of the UK. And when it comes down to hard policies that they intend to bring in that aren't already out there, they don't have them. And some of the ones that they do come forward with, we could already do with the powers that we have. Now, we lodged some simple FOIs after their last report, Deputy Presiding Officer. They stated in a press release, £5 billion increase in revenues by 2029. That was a headline in the Scottish Government's press release when they had their economic report. We simply asked in an FOI when they said that they could use the powers of independence to generate that tax revenue, could they show us the modelling on how they did that? The modelling on the employment increases, the productivity improvements and the increased migration. They had done no modelling, Deputy Presiding Officer, and they said we are satisfied that we do not have the information requested. <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, that £5 billion figure cannot be taken seriously. And it is the same again today with most of what was in the so-called top 10 reasons to become independent. But let me close with one thing, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary addresses this point in his closing speech. He has said, the Scottish Government has said, that if they don't get a currency union, they will walk away from all of the debt. Do all the members of the Fiscal Commission Working Group, all of them, support that stance and that argument? And if so, will they confirm it this evening or will they confirm it in the speech when it happens on Monday? Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. I now call on yeah. Jenny Mara around nine minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The point on unemployment is when the unemployment figures look um, good for Scotland, Mr Swinney and the SNP government take all the credit. And when the unemployment figures look worse and bad for Scotland, Mr Swinney turns it into an argument for Scotland to separate itself from the rest of the United Kingdom. And that goes to the shallowness of the SNP's whole case for independence, become, because become rail, rain, hail or shine, the SNP and their nationalism, their answer to every question is to separate this country from the rest of the United Kingdom. They wanted an independent Scotland during Attlee's reforming government in 1945. They wanted an independent government when our Labour government, Mike Russell may laugh, but this point has come up this afternoon, 
They wanted independence when our Labour government raised uh, two-thirds of children across the United Kingdom out of absolute poverty because power is about what you do with it, not where it is wielded. Now, this debate this afternoon, presiding officer, has been... Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Ms Mara for accepting the intervention. I'm intrigued by her argument that it's not where power is located. Why then were the Labour Party advocates for there being a Scottish Parliament that gives us the ability to determine policy choices differently to those in the rest of the United Kingdom? Why is that appropriate for education, for example, but not for welfare? Jenny Mara. Swinney seems to think that all power needs to be wielded in Edinburgh. The Labour Party, as he well knows, as he we well, let me answer, the Labour Party, as he well knows, believes in the principle of sub subsidiarity, that power is wielded at the most appropriate level, the European Union, Westminster, Holyrood and local government. Order, please. The debate this afternoon has been very reflective of the last week, presiding officer. The case for breaking up this union has completely fallen apart. Like the Emperor's new clothes, their failure to answer key questions has left the SNP naked and panicking. And that, that, has, been the, that has been the tenor of today's debate. Order, please, Ms Mara, can I stop you a moment? This debate has been conducted thus far with respect on all sides. I would hope it would continue that way until the end of the debate. Jenny Mara, please. I appreciate I have not created a pretty picture, uh, presiding officer, but I will try and continue. A list of assertions from the SNP speakers, which many of them were not prepared to be challenged on. Jamie Hepburn, Colin Beattie, Claire Adamson, not prepared to be challenged on these assertions. Kenny Gibson's list of assertions without any evidence. These assertions are becoming more shrill and fanciful by the day. When Maureen Watt announced at a conference that I attended that ferries would go faster in an independent Scotland, <laughs> I thought she was joking. <laughs> but Willie Rennie, Order, is right. Willie Rennie is right on this, presiding officer. Passion and nationalism is completely obscuring any grip on reality in the SNP benches. And this has been patently clear uh, to everyone listening to the, this debate this afternoon. And I was uh, looking at this plan for uh, jobs in an independent Scotland that uh, John Swinney has re-released. And I was particularly drawn to page number 24, Reindustrialising Scotland for the 21st Century. Because I was very intrigued by these five points. Establishing a Scottish Innovation Agency. I think the exchanges between uh, Gavin Brown and John Swinney earlier established that that could quite easily be done right now. Tax credits for R&D expenditure. This would be delivered in Independent Scotland. I believe there are already tax credit arrangements in the UK for R&D. Establishing a Scottish Business Development Bank. This is another new idea, a new proposal to reinvigorate the economy. But of course it's not, because it's been a disappearing and re appearing uh, pledge uh, over the last couple of years, ensuring a legal framework which protects and supports intellectual property rights. This again is another proposal which will um, bolster our economy, but I know that Mike Russell has told um, a very senior um, IP lawyer in this country that they have not the first idea about how they will establish intellectual property system once they come out of the very of the gold-plated uh, patents arrangements that we have as part of of the United Kingdom. Investing. Yes. Michael Russell. I mean, if the member has the evidence that I have said that in the way that she said, said it, then bring it forward. If she hasn't, then withdraw it. I mean, that is not a, a remark I have ever made. I am, of course, always willing to discuss these matters with lawyers and others. Jenny Mara. I understand that Mike Russell has said that they do not yet have a plan to establish an intellectual property system in Scotland. If he does have a plan, I'm ha if, if Mike Russell has a plan to establish an intellectual property system, I'd be happy to hear it now. Michael Russell. Clearly, I think... I think order, order, please. Michael Russell. If an assertion is made 
and no name is attached to it, then I think it's incumbent upon the member to bring that name forward, and I will contact that person to find out what is said. Order, please. Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, I think everyone in this chamber would agree with me that the actual plan for the system is much more important to the voters of Scotland than any name. But this point number five, investing in the world-class research of Scotland's universities and research institutes. Well, Alistair Darling and I recently visited uh, Dundee University and spoke to some of the most senior life sciences researchers in Scotland who said it would be the mother of all disasters for their research funding if Scotland were to leave the United Kingdom. Setting incentives to attract the best researchers from across the world. The other thing these researchers tell us is that the best researchers, they want funding and they want critical mass, these, these research relationships across the United Kingdom. Presiding officer, I, I think this plan today is a mix of we can do it now, it already exists, or these, uh, these pledges just seem to be quite fanciful. Presiding officer, I was also intrigued, uh, as Malcolm Chisholm said today, about the, um, the, more, the spending plans for the Trident Trillions. Because, you know, the Scottish Government estimates that it would cost £200 million to set up a new state of Scotland. I think quite um, a modest estimate. I think that would be the Trident money gone, if I'm not mistaken. But no, the SNP last week in a debate in this chamber uh, pledged to spend it on a convention on defence. They pledged to spend it on health. They pledged to spend it on education. They pledged to spend it on creating alternative jobs at Faz Lane. And now today they are pledging to spend it on childcare. There seems to be no end to this pot of money, uh, presiding officer. And again, I think the clothes have fallen off that pledge. And when we turn to tax, tax, I'm happy to take an intervention, Ms Adamson, if you'd like to, to offer one. Claire Adamson. Could I have Claire Adamson? Claire Adamson, please. Together are discontent to continue to spend the billions of pounds on Trident. Jenny Mara. Claire Adamson will know that I have campaigned long against nuclear weapons. <laughs> if, if I can Order, finish please. my point, Order. if I can finish this point to get rid of them all over the world. But she may also, she may also know. If you will let me speak. Order. Order. You may also know that I think the SNP's pledge to get rid of Trident is an absolute fallacy because of when, when it comes to negotiation in the event of a yes vote between Alex Salmond and the British Government, it will be the first thing to fall off Alex Salmond's agenda. And there are senior people in Yes Scotland that agree with me on that. Presiding officer. Order, please. Presiding officer, the people of Scotland have a right to expect better from their government than the situation to which we have been led. We just have over four weeks until a referendum that proposes to end one of the world's oldest economic union. The pound in our pocket is nothing to do with identity. It is no posturing. It is in essence a contract, a sign of trust, a trade that is made and that you will receive value for your labour. It is a contract. In the derogation of their duty, the SNP and Alex Salmond have broken in front of the world their contract with the people of Scotland in their failure to come up with a plan B on currency. Ms Mara, draw to close, please. I will do. This unholy mess is not fit for Scotland. And let us say clearly to all those people listening, this rank incompetence from the SNP is not Scotland. And after the 18th of September, we must all work together to make it good. Thank you. Can I now call on Michael Russell to wind up the debate and Cabinet Secretary, you have until five o'clock. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, let me give a revelation here. I think the evidence of this afternoon is that there are no votes in this chamber up for grabs in the referendum. <laughs> I think it is pretty clear across this chamber that there are no undecideds on these benches. Now, perhaps there are some undecideds at home watching. Now, I suspect they may have turned off by now, particularly after Jenny Mara's speech, but if they are still watching, can I, make, can I make a suggestion to them that if they try to come to a judgment on this debate, and there are people in the, um, in the galleries who might want to judge it, do it on one thing. Do it on the basis of what has been the positive view and the negative view. 
Look at the positive view that has been expressed by all my colleagues in this chamber and look at the endless destructive negativity that we've had from Labour, Liberals and the Tories. And let me start with the clearest view of the currency issue. The First Minister has ever got it right in this chamber last week. I'm going to repeat his exact words. It's our pound and we're keeping it. No ifs, no buts. That's the guarantee. That's plan A to Z. So for the benefit of those who are still trying, still trying to frighten people out of what is theirs, people like Mr Henry, who asserted today that Scots won't be able to go to buy food or to go on holiday after independence. Mr Fraser, who referred very tellingly, Mr Fraser, no, I won't take an intervention. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One, one contribution to Mr Henry in an afternoon is more than enough. I have to say more than enough. Or Mr Fraser, who referred to the currency as belonging to someone else. That was very interesting indeed. Let me just repeat it so there can be no doubt. It's our pound and we're keeping it. Cabinet Secretary, we have a point of order. Point of order from Hugh Henry, please. President Officer, Mr Russell just made a statement attributing words to me which I did not say. Yep. Is, it in order, is it in order for members to fabricate words and attribute them to other members, words which were not said during this debate? Order, please. Order. It is entirely up to members what they say within their speeches. It is not for me to, make, to decide what members should and should not say within their speeches. However, undoubtedly, the official, record has a, the official record shows every word that is said in this chamber. Michael Russell. Thank you. Uh, I am sure that uh, Mr Henry reflects on that when he looks at what he said about me and, and my writings. I am sure he will think about that carefully. But Mr Henry's words speak for themselves, as does Mr Henry's depressing demeanour. Yeah. But this has been a debate of great contrasts. And the contrasts are this, and I go back to this issue of positivity and negativity. My friend Mr Swinney talking about ambition, achievement, resources, potential, raising the eyes of Scotland to what can be achieved. In my own area of special interest, talking about the need for transformative childcare, talking about the world leading position in Scottish higher education. And what was the result? Well, this was the result. Oh, Ten please. minutes in, Mr. Rennie gave the knee jerk plan B at first outing. Mr. Brown then leapt back in. The project fear was in there at working hard. And the other side of the unionist coin then showed itself. It was quite stunning. Uh, um, Alec Johnston was chuntering on from a sedentary position about the fact that everything, everything mentioned was a product of the wonderful union. But he was being interrupted by Jenny Mara, who said that everything was a result of the failed SNP. So there you have it. That's a contrast. Labour hate the SNP more than anybody else, and the Tories love the union more than anything else. I don't think either of those are a prescription for a safe future. And I'll tell you what's not a prescription for a safe future, too. It is to believe that weapons of mass destruction will be removed by a Labour government. Yeah. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. How else are we to get rid of weapons of mass destruction except by independence? And that's the reality. And it was very telling this afternoon that when Mr Swinney mentioned Trident, but what we needed to do, the reaction from Labour, from Tories, even from the sole Lib Dem who was there, was derision. They do want to put bombs before bairns. Absolutely. They do want to put trident before teachers. That is their shame. Now let me, let me, let me carry on, because this obsession, this obsession, this absolute obsession... Uh, no, I'm not going to take an intervention, Mr Bibby. No, sorry. The, the, reality of this, the reality of this debate was shown so clearly this afternoon. It was about that negative view. Nothing could be done. And you had to ask, you had to ask what was it about? And Maureen Watt got it 100% right. She analysed the debate early on. Because the great fear that exists in Project Fear is that could, should, must progression. Because if any member on those benches could admit that Scotland could be independent, and I'll come to Elaine Murray in a moment, because she did momentarily. 
If any member can admit that Scotland could be independent, then this whole fantasy collapses. Because what when we have is that Scotland should be independent. And that's the argument that came from my colleagues this afternoon. And then it goes a step further. Scotland must be independent. And the biggest, the biggest illustration of that was Malcolm Chisholm. I was, yet again, saddened by Malcolm Chisholm's contribution. I have admiration and time for Malcolm Chisholm. He's laughing at this, but I do. I don't think that he and I differ very much in some of the things we want to see. But here's, here's the difference. Here's the difference. Our Labour wants to laugh at this because it's beginning to strike home. Here's the difference. The difference is myself and my colleagues have a plan how to achieve those things. We know how those things can be achieved. We know how poverty can be eliminated in Scotland. We know that it is more... No, I'm not taking Ian Gray. No, either. I want to finish this point because I know it's annoying to Ian Gray. But here's Mr. the truth. Gray. You can have a plan to change Scotland to do those things. You can set out with those intentions and you can work hard for them. Or you can simply keep your fingers crossed that sometimes you might get a Labour government. Sometimes you might get a Labour government that could possibly follow the things you want to see in Scotland rather than the things that Ed Balls and Miliband want to see south of the border. That's not a plan that you've got, Mr Chisholm. What that actually is, is just keeping your fingers crossed and putting party before principle. I'll take his intervention. Malcolm Chisholm. Well, uh, the, uh, Order. The Cabinet Secretary Let's see may Mr. have a plan, but the whole point of all the speeches on this side this afternoon is to point out that it is not a plan that can be delivered without an economic foundation. And before he has any more uh, claptrap about the negativity of this side, will he reflect on the fact that by far the biggest and most disgraceful scare of this campaign is what the yes side is saying about the NHS? <laughs> Mr. Russell, sit down. I heard that, and that's quite enough. There's far too much heckling, there's far too much noise. The Minister is speaking, allow him to do so. This is a Parliament, it is not a public meeting, it is not a hustings. So please, there are people in Scotland listening to this debate, make it worthy of them. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, last week the person who got that agitated about the issue of the NHS was Jackson Carlaw. Ch applauding this afternoon, applauding and applauding and applauding. And why? Because we've hit the nail on the head. If the power of finance lies outside Scotland, then the decision on the priorities of Scotland, how we deliver those priorities in Scotland, always then lies outside Scotland too. For every £100 that is reduced in expenditure south of the border by privatisation of the health service, Privatisation started by Labour. Privatisation of the health service, you leave 100, lose £100, you lose £10 from the Scottish budget. If you look at the privatisation, no, Mr Finlay, if you look at the privatisation of higher education south of the border, every £100 that's removed there, then we lose £10 from Scotland. There's the reality. There's the nub of this debate today. It is we can choose to make our decisions in Scotland and take our responsibilities in Scotland and have opportunities in Scotland, or we can always dance to somebody else's tune. <laughs> Presiding Officer Malcolm Chisholm wants the progress in Scotland that I want to see. I repeat what I said earlier. This side of the chamber has the plan to do that. It puts its confidence. You can hear the Tories laughing. You can always hear the Tories laughing when the people of Scotland want to progress. Now here's the choice. Here's the choice. You can say to the people of Scotland, take responsibility and then you will have the opportunities to change this country for the better. Or you can listen to those voices who will not accept the reality, who will always keep their fingers crossed in case England votes the same way as they do and will always disappoint and let down the people of Scotland. Well, that's got to stop. The lesson this afternoon is entirely clear, presiding officer. There is a jobs plan 
for an independent Scotland. There is a finance plan for an independent Scotland. There is a currency plan for an independent Scotland. There is a plan to make the independent Scotland the country that it could and should be. The people who stand in the way of that are this unholy alliance between Labour and the Tories. You need to finish, Cabinet Secretary. The people who have plenty of ambition for their political parties and none for their country. Order. Order. That concludes the debate on economic opportunities of independence. Before we come to decision time, I'm sure members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Dr Peter Ammann, the Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10769.1.1 in the name of Gavin Brown, which seeks to amend amendment number 10769.1 in the name of Ian Gray on economic opportunities of independence be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10769.1.1 in the name of Gavin Brown is as follows. Yes, 45. No, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10769.1 in the name of Ian Gray, which seeks to amend motion number 10769 in the name of John Swinney on economic opportunities and independence be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10769.1 in the name of Ian Gray is as follows. Yes, 46. No, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10769 in the name of John Swinney on economic opportunities of independence be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cancel votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10769 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 63. No, 46. There were no abstention. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.